Mic check for the reporter. Mic check, testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. Mic check for the reporter, testing one, two, three, testing one, two, three. Mic check. Testing one, two, three, testing one, two, three. You want to see the bottom of that? Testing, testing, test, 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 test. Testing, testing, one, two, three, test, test. Test, test, testing, audio check, testing. Test, test, one, two, three, testing, testing. Testing, testing. Oh. Testing one, two, three. Audio check for the reporter. Testing one, two, three.
know when you're ready. Testing, testing, audio, check for the stenographer, testing.
The Subcommittee on Highways and Transit will come to order. I ask unanimous consent that the Chairman be authorized to declare a recess at any time during today's hearing. Without objection, so ordered. I also ask unanimous consent that members not on the Subcommittee be permitted to sit with the Subcommittee at today's hearing and ask questions without objection, so ordered. As a reminder, if members wish to insert a document into the record, Please also email it to documentsti at mail.house.gov. I ask unanimous consent to enter a letter from Senator Capito and several other senators and a press release from Senator Kramer into the record without objection, so ordered. I now recognize myself for the purposes of an opening statement. 
for five minutes. A good morning. I thank each of our witnesses for being here today. The Undersecretary and the four modal administration, administrators before us represent the full scope of the jurisdiction of the Subcommittee on Highways and Transit. However, despite the subcommittee's long record of bipartisan oversight efforts, we've not had any modal administrators before us since 2019. Today's witnesses can help provide clarity on myriad issues related to the implementation of the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, or IJA, as they and the people and programs they represent play a pivotal role in the Department of Transportation's efforts to enact this legislation. Just last month, we marked two years since the passage of IJA, which provided historic funding increases for America's infrastructure, including over a half trillion dollars for programs under the subcommittee's jurisdiction. IJA significantly increased funding for existing programs, created new programs with new eligibilities, and increased by nearly 500% the amount of competitive grant funding the secretary will award. The five-year average Funding provided by IJA for the modes under this subcommittee's jurisdiction increased by approximately 80% compared to the levels in the last surface reauthorization bill, the Fixing America's Surface Transportation, or FAST Act. In the two years since IJA became law, persistent inflation has pushed up prices. Transportation and infrastructure projects and the companies that provide products and services in those sectors have not been immune to these rising costs. Prices on necessary materials such as concrete and aggregate, pipes, steel and iron, construction equipment, and labor have all remained high since the passage of IJA. In September, the Federal Highway Administration released updated data for its National Highway Construction Costs Index. What Federal Highways found was in the first quarter of 2023, the construction index reached a new all-time high. Further, according to the Department of Transportation's Bureau of Transportation Statistics, highway construction costs have increased in nine of the last 10 quarters, and compared to the last quarter of 2020, highway construction costs increased 53.8%. The expected increases in purchasing power provided by IJA has therefore greatly diminished. Not only am I concerned about inflationary pressures on IJA and its projects, but as I've said many times before, the administration's focus should be on acting the legislation as written, not on pushing progressive policy proposals that didn't make it into the final law. For example, the day before Thanksgiving, when I'm sure all of us were focused on refreshing the department's website just waiting for an important proclamation, FHWA announced that it had, at lightning speed, finalized the rule to create a new greenhouse gas performance measure to cut tailpipe emissions stemming from transportation on the national highway system. I understand that you all have seemingly been tasked by the White House with tackling climate change first and your core mission second. But our concern is that during consideration of IJA, the Senate considered this policy proposal and expressly excluded it from the final legislation. There's simply no congressional mandate or provided authority to take this action. Another example, DOT with strong direction from the policy office has been using its funding notices for discretionary grant programs to layer on requirements that do not exist in statute. And while we've received press release after press release announcing funding awards, these are not legally binding documents. I think we can all agree that federal money has plenty of strings attached to it by Congress. But there's no reason to add even more at the agency level. I'm also very concerned at the extremely slow rate that these grant agreements are being negotiated among the parties and signed, since according to the numbers, they aren't. You advertise that, they're, that you're making grants, but the money isn't going out the door and projects aren't being done. I could go on, but I simply reiterate the message from our shared transportation stakeholders. Slow execution of contracts and confusing guidance documents have the very real risk of delaying critical transportation projects, which are necessary to move people and freight safely and efficiently through the country. Even though I don't, did not support IJA, it's the law, and I will ensure that the resources provided by Congress are addressing our most pressing transportation, safety, infrastructure, and supply chain needs which I know is a shared bipartisan goal of all of us here in the room today. The bill was not a blank check for this administration to pursue ancillary social or environmental policies unrelated to the nation's transportation systems. This committee will work with DOT and the agencies represented here to ensure the taxpayer dollars are spent wisely and prudently on the real infrastructure improvements our nation requires. Once again, I thank our witnesses for appearing before the committee today and I look forward to a productive dialogue. I now recognize Ranking Member Norton for five minutes for an opening statement. I would like to thank Subcommittee Chair Rick Crawford for holding this hearing on the implementation of the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. The Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act was one of the most important bills enacted by last, last Congress. Within our subcommittee's jurisdiction, it provided $365 billion 
for highways, $108 billion for transit, $43 billion for multimodal grants, and $13 billion for highway and motor carrier safety. The work of our subcommittee helped set the bar high. Many of the funding levels of the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act are similar to what we proposed in the INVEST Act. Two years in, we are seeing the success of the law across the country. This past summer, the National Capital Regions Transit Agency, the Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority, received a $104 million grant from the Federal Transit Administration to purchase zero emission buses, convert an existing maintenance facility to serve electric buses, and train its workforce to operate and maintain electric buses. I thank Administrator Fernandez and the Biden administration for this investment in good jobs and cleaner act for our region. Success stories like this are playing out across the nation. Every member in this room today, whether they voted for the Infrastructure Investment Jobs Act or not, has at least one project funded in their congressional district. As implementation continues, our country will see safer transportation, improved mobility, a cleaner environment, and better access for all communities. Much work remains to be done. America is experiencing an epidemic of traffic fatalities, which is falling disproportionately on pedestrians, cyclists, and communities of color. I look forward to hearing from each of our witnesses about their work to prevent these fatalities. We must reckon with the rise of new technology, such as autonomous vehicles and what it means for our workforce. Our workers are the backbone of our transportation network. As new technologies become prevalent, we must ensure that we protect jobs and give workers a seat at the table. We must also work to mitigate the impact of our transportation system on the environment. Transportation is the largest source of greenhouse gas emissions in the United States, and our transportation policies and programs must be reformed accordingly. Expanding access to transit, walking and biking infrastructure is a key part of the solution. I also support the Federal Highway Administration's new requirement that states and metropolitan planning organizations track their highway emissions and make plans to reduce them. This requirement is derived from authority provided by Congress in 2012 and is a critical step in the right direction. I also appreciate Department of Transportation-wide efforts to improve equity and address the decades of harm caused by our transportation system at, uh, uh, to low-income communities and communities of color. I urge the department to ensure the neighborhood access and equity funding approved by this committee as part of the Inflation Reduction Act is quickly put to use. Thank you to our witnesses today. I appreciate your diligent work to implement the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act and the diverse and thoughtful perspectives you bring to the challenges ahead. I look forward to today's discussion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Norton. Um, and I would recognize Chairman Graves. He's not able to be with us for this particular hearing, so I now recognize the ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Larson, for five minutes for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, I want to thank the Chair and ranking member for having this hearing today, and I want to welcome all, all the DOT witnesses, and thanks for participating in the subcommittee hearing today uh, to, about your work to implement the BIL. Uh, the bipartisan infrastructure law is, uh, and this hearing today is another opportunity to highlight how these federal infrastructure dollars are benefiting communities and helping us build a cleaner, greener, safer, and more accessible transportation system. Congress provided $530 billion in the BIL for roads, bridges, transit, buses, ferries, and other infrastructure needs under this subcommittee's jurisdiction. The investment level and number of new initiatives in the BIL far exceeds previous transportation bills, and Congress handed DOT a tall order in implementing this legislation. Yet in the first two fiscal years of the BIL, the department distributed over $180 billion in highway funds 
and 40 billion in transit funds to states and localities. Funding has gone out uh, under more than three dozen competitive grant programs and more is on the way. Uh, just this morning, the department announced awards for the Safe Streets for All program, totaling $810 million for 385 projects nationwide, including, and you'll be surprised when we talk about, talking about this, three in my district. Um, yes, indeed, totaling about $1.4 million to help the city of Anacortes and Skagit County develop uh, roadway safety action plans and the Lummi Indian Business Council to test nine safety demonstration projects. Yesterday, the department announced awards for 18 projects under the Rural Surface Transportation Grant Program, which totaled $645 million. This funding will help rural communities reconstruct road and freight infrastructure to make them safer and more accessible. I highlight these award announcements because they clearly demonstrate how communities across the U.S. are seeing the benefits of the bipartisan infrastructure law. They're also seeing the benefits in this law from, by the creation of jobs. These dollars translate into projects on the ground and jobs for American workers. Through September 23, these dollars have supported over 60,000 highway projects alone, according to an analysis by the American Road and Transportation Builders Association. There's at least one new project underway in every congressional district in the country, according to ARTPA. Thanks to the BIL, the department has awarded $25 million in raised grants to Whatcom County in my district to replace the 60-year-old Lummi Island Ferry. Projects like this one and other projects across the country means jobs, jobs with good wages, benefits, and working conditions for transportation workers and manufacturers. The BIL means more jobs in the transportation construction, transit, trucking, aviation, rail, and maritime sectors. Without these investments, the economy would be in far worse shape. We are only two years through a five-year bill, and the department has invested in projects across the country, and there is more to come. And now Congress has a job of conducting oversight of implement, implementation efforts by DOT, state DOTs, project sponsors, and industry to ensure these projects are delivered quickly and effectively, and a law is implemented in line with congressional intent. Congress directed investments in the BIL to address many things, including addressing climate change and reducing carbon pollution. We directed investments to improve safety and equity outcomes on our transportation networks. And we wanted to put more decision-making power in the hands of local communities whose leaders know their infrastructure best. These and other changes are now in the hands of DOT to execute. I applaud the department's efforts to date on this front and the steps taken to address the unacceptably high rate of deaths to prioritize equity consideration grants to ensure disadvantaged business enterprises reap the benefits of BIL funding and to measure and reduce carbon pollution from transportation sources as provided in, in transportation law dating back a decade. I welcome this opportunity to once again acknowledge and celebrate the infrastructure benefits each of our districts and constituents are reaping. This committee continues delivering bipartisan solutions for all Americans. I want to thank the witnesses for their service and for guiding your agencies and priorities uh, and, and, and for the priorities Congress has asked you to implement. Uh, I look forward to today's discussion. With that, I yield back. Thank you, Ranking Member. Uh, before I proceed, I want to welcome our newest member of the subcommittee, uh, Representative Malloy from Utah. Thank you for being with us, and welcome to the subcommittee. Um, and I now want to welcome our witnesses and thank them for being here today. The Honorable Carlos Mahe, Undersecretary of Transportation for Policy Office of the Secretary of Transportation. The Honorable Shailene Bott, Administrator of Federal Highway Administration. The Honorable Nuria Fernandez, Administrator, Federal Transportation Administration. The Honorable Robin Hutchison, Administrator, Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration. And Ms. Ann Carlson, Acting Administrator, National Highway Safety, Traffic Safety Administration. Briefly, I probably don't have to go into great detail. You know how these lights work. Green means go. Yellow means step on the gas because it's fixing to turn red. That means you're going to run out of time. Due to the nature of, uh, of the uh, committee hearings that we have five Witnesses, we ask you to strictly adhere to the five minutes. If you if you hear this little sound, that means you're exceeding your five minute allotted time, and we'll ask you to wrap quickly so that we can get on to the next witness and then uh, to uh, member questions. I ask unanimous consent that the witnesses' full statements be included in the record without objection. So ordered. I ask unanimous consent that the record of today's hearing remain open until such time as our witnesses provided answers to any questions that may be submitted to them in writing without objection. So ordered. I also ask unanimous consent that the record remain open for 15 days for any additional comments and information submitted by members or witnesses to be included in the record of today's hearing without objection, so ordered. 
As your written testimony has been made part of the record, the subcommittee asks again that you limit your uh, oral remarks to five minutes. With that, uh, Mr. Undersecretary Mahe, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Chairman Graves, Ranking Member Larson, Chair Crawford, and Ranking Member Norton, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today and for your support as we continue to build a stronger, safer transportation system. Last month, the administration celebrated our second year of implementing the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, through which we've already implemented 37 new programs and announced funding for more than 40,000 projects and counting in every corner of the country. The, the department has continued its strong history of accountability, responsibility, and financial stewardship. The career team behind TO DOT's implementation efforts won a 2023 Samuel J. Hyman Service to America Medal that's the Sammies, it's the Oscars for public servants, and the work doesn't stop. Just this week, as uh, Mr. Larson mentioned, we announced 650 million to 18 projects in rural areas to reconstruct or replace critical roads and bridges and upgrade freight hubs and expand transit service. I'd like to share a few notable examples of how we're delivering on these priorities. Safety is the department's top priority, and in 2022, Secretary Buttigieg announced an ambitious goal of zero roadway deaths through the department's national roadway safety strategy. The infrastructure law gave us unprecedented resources to invest in road safety across the country. Awards under the Safe Streets and Roads for All program are already benefiting 70% of our nation's population. Earlier today, Secretary Buttigieg announced another 817 million for 385 projects to continue helping communities deploy safety improvements like enhanced crosswalks, roundabouts, and improved lighting. We're also making our roads and rails safer by improving risky at-grade at rail crossing, advancing life-saving technologies like automatic emergency braking, and expanding the availability of truck parking. We're doing all of this first and foremost so that our loved ones make it to holiday dinners, to make sure that the simple act of walking to the grocery store or biking to work are as safe as they can be. But preventing crashes also benefits our economy, complementing the administration-wide efforts to provide American workers and businesses access to resources, access to markets, and good-paying union jobs. We are strengthening America's trucking workforce and creating pathways to attain more drivers through apprenticeship programs. Meanwhile, we're investing heavily in our multimodal freight network, improving our ports, and investing $40 billion to replace and upgrade critical bridges across the country including the Arlen D. Williams Jr. Memorial Bridge right here in Washington and the Brent Spence Bridge between Kentucky and Ohio, the second worst bottleneck for trucks in the country. Infrastructure investments like these are critical to making our supply chains more efficient, which ultimately cuts costs for consumers and drives down inflation. It's gonna help your holiday presents arrive on time, keep store shelves stocked, and provide access to jobs, schools, and other vital destinations. As we work to improve the safety of our transportation system and strengthen it as a core driver of our nation's economy, we're mindful that the investments must, much reach, must reach everyone, especially in communities that historically have been left out of, of meaningful investments. That means rural and tribal communities and communities of color. New programs created by the infrastructure law will reconnect communities that were previously divided by transportation structures. From capping interstates to reconfiguring interchanges to extending transit service, all so people can get to their destination safely and easily. We also know that smaller governments agencies face a steep learning curve as they try to navigate federal funding landscape. That's why we're providing technical tools and organizational capacity, leveraging the experience of nonprofits, academia, and the private sector to help disadvantaged and under-resourced communities compete for federal aid and deliver those projects once they get it all in an effort to accelerate the benefits of those investments. Through this work, we're building a more efficient and resilient transportation system while carb cutting carbon pollution and creating jobs. For example, we're investing in modernizing our nation's bus fleet, more than doubling the number of zero and low emission buses on our roadways while creating good paying jobs in manufacturing operations and maintenance. We're also working with state and local governments to create convenient, reliable, affordable, and equitable national EV charging network which is already spurring private sector investment. These generational investments will benefit our entire nation, from its densest cities to its most remote communities. 
Whether you walk, roll, ride, or drive, we're committed to making your transportation experience safer, cleaner, more affordable, more reliable, and more efficient. And we're committed to working alongside Congress to deliver on these promises for the American people. Thank you again. I look forward to your question. Thank you, Mr. Bott. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Crawford, uh, Ranking Member Larson, and Ranking Member Norton, and members of the subcommittee. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. The bipartisan infrastructure law represents a once-in-a-generation investment in our nation's infrastructure. Competitiveness, communities, and resilience to climate change and the Inflation Reduction Act provide historic investments and new opportunities to build a clean energy economy that creates good jobs and lowers costs for all working families. The dedication of the Federal Highway Administration staff in delivering on the promise of these historic investments for the American public is inspiring. I have always said that a transportation agency exists for two reasons, to save lives and to make people's lives better. FHWA's mission begins and ends with safety. Last month, I joined state and local officials at the site of a fire that took place under a section of I-10 near downtown Los Angeles, resulting in a closure in both directions. Within days, FHWA announced the immediate availability of $3 million in quick release emergency relief funds for use by Caltrans to offset costs of emergency repair work. FHWA offered support to state local officials and provided technical assistance to help respond to closure of this vital corridor. Eight days after the fire, I was pleased to join local, state, and federal officials as Governor Gavin Newsom announced the reopening of the I-10 freeway. In June, FHWA provided a similar level of emergency support to help reopen I-95 in Philadelphia in record time after the tragic tanker truck explosion, which resulted in loss of life and a partial collapse of a bridge. In addition to safety, FHWA's work is guided by an initiative we refer to as Driven for the 21st Century. There are six aspects of this initiative, delivery, resilience, innovation, values, equity, and our nation. It is this first aspect of driven delivery that I would like to focus on today. While everyone celebrates receiving a grant award, we at FHWA are committed to turning those awards into successful projects. Thanks to Bill and Ira, we have the funding necessary to make major improvements in our transportation system. FHWA has taken numerous actions supporting implementation of projects that improve safety and people's lives, including distributing more than $180 billion in highway formula funding to states and issue, issuing notices of funding opportunity for approximately $14.7 billion in available funds. We are currently administering nearly 1,500 grants, totaling approximately $10 billion across 15 discretionary programs, with more to come. I recognize that inflationary pressure can present challenges for project sponsors, but this is not a unique challenge for U.S. transportation projects. I previously served in the private sector in a global transportation role, and inflation is a challenge we are dealing with on transportation projects globally. At FHWA, we are aware of these challenges and recognize that time is money, which is why we are committed to helping deliver projects on time and on budget. The success of the bill and IRA programs depend in part on streamlined delivery of funding to recipients. FHWA stood up a new permanent team to oversee grant management matters. We also implemented process reforms, and we continue to refine our management of these programs to increase efficiency and transparency, thereby benefiting the nation via the delivery of new projects. The bipartisan infrastructure law is funding projects throughout the country that will deliver results for the U.S. transportation system and Americans as a whole. For example, the Bridge Investment Program, large grant awards FHWA announced in January 2023 included $1.385 billion to rehabilitate and reconfigure the existing Brent Spence Bridge to improve interstate and local traffic flow between the interconnected Kentucky and Ohio communities on either side of the Ohio River. FHWA is focused on strong engagement with states and locals as they deliver the many projects funded by the bill, ranging from small routine projects to large complex projects like the Brent Spence Bridge. For example, Key members of FHWA's leadership team and myself are in regular communication with Ohio and Kentucky leadership to ensure that this critical project stays on track. As administrator, I have had the privilege to travel around the country to see and hear how the, the immediate need for safer, accessible, and resilient transportation. The transformational funding provided by Congress has enabled FHWA in partnership with states and localities to create a system that delivers for our economy and all of our people while getting individuals and goods safely to their destinations. There are no Democratic roads or Republican bridges. Transportation binds us all together 
which is why we must work with each other to support the common good. FHWA remains committed to this task. Thank you again for the opportunity to appear before you today. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Bott. Uh, Administrator Fernandez, you're recognized for five minutes. Can you hit your microphone, ma'am? Thank you, sir. There we go. Good morning, uh, Chairman Crawford, Ranking Member Holmes, Norton, uh, Ranking Member Larson, and members of the committee. Thank you for this opportunity to talk about President Biden's bipartisan infrastructure law. The Federal Transit Administration has been hard at work delivering the first two years of the largest investment in public transportation in American history, making available nearly $40 billion to transit operators in communities nationwide. That is on top of our continued administration of critical emergency relief funds. All told, we have invested more than $63 billion in almost 9,000 projects since November of 2021. And our work is far from done. In Arkansas, thanks to the bipartisan infrastructure law, Jonesboro received nearly $2 million to transition to hybrid diesel electric buses. For the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe in South Dakota, a 600,000 tribal transit grant means more reliable trips on a new bus and van, expanding transit across a 4,200 square mile reservation. Trains, buses, ferries, and equipment to maintain and modernize them are being made in America at over a thousand companies nationwide. FTA's capital investment grants program also continues building community improving projects. From $240 million in Minneapolis, St. Paul, to expand a successful transit network into historically underserved communities, to $150 million in Pittsburgh, building high capacity bus transit along one of the busiest corridors in the Steel City. Both will reduce traffic and emissions and help thousands get to jobs and school and healthcare. FTA carefully following transit ridership trends nationwide. In the past two years, ridership increased to 77% of pre-COVID levels. As agencies better understand community needs and adjust service to meet those needs, some agencies are actually seeing ridership above pre-pandemic levels. Agencies large and small have redesigned bus routes, creating better service outside of traditional hours and providing equity of opportunity. To help that progress, FDA funded 50 projects in 24 states to plan and adapt to these new patterns. Communities, including some of our largest cities, do face fiscal challenges in transit operations. However, providing transportation for the people of our nation is not a responsibility that we can simply decline. So President Biden proposed expanded flexibility in how federal transit funds can keep America moving. In the minds of some, transit only is important in those big cities. Yes, urban areas are using increased transit investments to enhance regional economies. However, transit provides more than economic value to urban, rural, and suburban communities across the country. It also shows a moral commitment to leaving no American behind. For every subway commuter, a veteran rides a prior transit van to a medical appointment at the VA hospital. For every college student, Heading to class, a small town worker rides to job training. Both take the bus toward a successful future. For every millennial riding transit to his first job in a big city, a rural baby boomer has the freedom transit provides to grow old in her hometown. In Mississippi, FDA funded transit covering 26 rural communities. A woman in Jackson told me about her husband who was in the hospital. She had a doctor's appointment and he normally drove her. And for the first time, she used on-demand transit. Her house is on a dirt road that doesn't even have a name. The transit driver picked her up, took her to the doctor and returned her home. She said she never thought she would be one of those people who needed the services we support. Like millions of riders, she discovered transit when she needed it most. Thanks to the bipartisan infrastructure law, many people are experiencing more freedom thanks to more service. Well, we still have work to done. Decades of underinvestment created a $105 billion backlog in state of good repair. Manufacturing transit vehicles become, need to become more efficient and less expensive. And transitioning to zero emission future requires reskilling, increasing transit workforce. FDA is working to meet all of these challenges. We are also working to end assault against transit workers because it's unacceptable that any public servant should worry about whether they will return home safely. For every dollar invested in transit, $5 of value is created. And, but the impact of transit is not only felt at the bottom lines, it is measured at the bottom step. When riders exit through open doors into a wider world of opportunity, 
Thanks to the bipartisan infrastructure law, the world is closer than ever. As we build more American vehicles, train more workers, connect more Americans with their communities and opportunities they offer. I look forward to your questions today and thank you. Thank you, Administrator Hutchison, you recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Crawford, Chairman Graves, Ranking Member Larson, and Ranking Member Holmes Norton for your leadership on this subcommittee. And to all committee members, thank you for the opportunity to testify today and for your ongoing partnership. When I was confirmed as administrator of the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration, there was an unprecedented spotlight, not only on the trucking and motor coach industry, but on the men and women driving that industry, the truck drivers. Coming off the heels of the pandemic, Americans are now acutely aware of the impact of a truck driver's work. From the long haul drivers delivering 75% of our goods annually, to the school bus drivers taking our children to school, and to the city drivers picking up our recycling, there's no doubt that drivers are essential to our daily lives. Today, I'm happy to report that we have kept that spotlight shining on the industry as we carry out our mission to reduce crashes, injuries, and fatalities involving large trucks and buses. Roadway safety affects not only those whose lives were lost, but the family members and loved ones who suffer the grief of loss. We have more work to do, and we can and we must do better. The industry is supported by the historic passage of the bipartisan infrastructure law. I want to thank you all for the opportunity to work with you on this unprecedented investment, which has allowed not only FMCSA, but our partners to carry out safety priorities to achieve our ambitious goal of zero fatalities on our nation's roadways and to support the goals of the Department of Transportation, safety, economic strength, equity, climate, and transformation. We continue to work with our state and local government boots on the ground partners across the country on the critical goals of improving safety, leveraging the increased resources in our formula and discretionary grants by prioritizing inspections for high risk carriers, dedicating resources to high crash corridors and work zones, and closing loopholes to prevent unsafe drivers and carriers from ever being on the road. Truck drivers are essential safety partners. Data demonstrates that the safest drivers are those that have been in the industry the longest. We need to understand why are drivers leaving the industry. I've ridden along with long haul drivers in the Midwest and municipal drivers in rural Alaska, hosted listening sessions with stakeholders and asked these questions. We know that drivers need to feel safe, have access to training, and to be well compensated to both enter and stay within the industry. We've taken that feedback and leveraged the bipartisan infrastructure law resources to assist the truck driving profession and our nation's supply chain by creating a better, safer pipeline of drivers and improving recruitment and retention in the profession. And our assistance underscores the department's goals as it sits at the intersection of safety, economic strength, and equity. We established the bipartisan infrastructure law women of trucking advisory board to understand and address obstacles including violence, harassment, and discrimination for women entering and remaining in the industry. We have created action items to reduce those barriers because the plain fact is we can't leave any talents on the table. We have implemented requirements to ensure that drivers entering the industry have a minimum level of training. We use bipartisan and structural law funding to train veterans and their families, members of underserved communities, and others in safely operating a commercial motor vehicle so they may enter the industry. We awarded bipartisan infrastructure law grant funding to expedite commercial driver's license issuances. And since 2021, states have issued over 1.3 commercial driver's licenses. We've also launched initiatives to study compensation, predatory leasing arrangements, detention time, and work with our departmental colleagues to address truck parking. FMCSA has increased efforts to combat commercial operations fraud, bolstering the goals of safety and economic strength, we implemented a strategic action plan to address fraudulent household goods activities, including the launch of the Protect Your Move campaign. The campaign spanned 16 states and resulted in 700 closed complaints and a 36% reduction in consumer reports. Finally, we have dedicated grant funding and resources to prevent human trafficking, underscoring our safety and equity goals, and we completed 50 outreach events this year. With our continued partners' work, our driver focus on prevention, and your historic investment in safety, we can meet our shared goals of reducing crashes on our nation's roadways, 
Thank you so much for the opportunity to share FMCSA's work and our successes in implementing the bipartisan infrastructure law. Thank you, Administrator Carlson. You're recognized for five minutes. Good morning, Chairman Crawford, Ranking Member Larson, Ranking Member Norton, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for inviting me to testify today on NHTSA's efforts under the leadership of Secretary Pete Buttigieg to fulfill the agency's important safety mission. Every person has been touched by crashes on our nation's roads. Many of us, me included, have lost loved ones, friends, or family to a crash. And virtually everyone knows someone who has been injured. That's why NHTSA's work touches every person in the United States every day. NHTSA is committed to making the nation's roads safer for everyone, preventing crashes, and reducing fatalities, injuries, and the economic cost of crashes on our roads. Today, I'm pleased to share new early estimates of traffic fatalities for January through September 2023, which project that traffic fatalities declined for the sixth straight quarter. We're projecting that fatalities decreased about 4.5% from the same time in 2022. While we're optimistic that we're finally seeing a reversal of the record high fatalities seen during the pandemic, this is not a cause for celebration. An estimated 19,515 people died in motor vehicle traffic crashes in the first half of 2023, a devastating loss that Secretary Buttigieg has rightly called a crisis on our roadways. That's why NHTSA and the whole U.S. Department of Transportation is leaning in on the safe system approach and the department's national roadway safety strategy. The only acceptable number of fatalities is zero. Getting to zero will require consistent, dedicated focus and work from every level of government, safety advocates, and the private sector. One way we're working through zero fatalities or toward zero fatalities is by using the remarkable new resources Congress provided NHTSA through the bill, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law. I thank you for increasing NHTSA's overall budget by more than 50%. Bill also directs us to conduct a number of new research projects and rulemakings. NHTSA continues to work as quickly as possible on these critical projects and rules to save lives and to meet our statutory obligations. We've issued a proposed rule to require automatic emergency braking, we call it AEB, and pedestrian AEB, and new passenger cars and light trucks. With FMCSA, we've issued a proposed rule to require AEB and heavy vehicles, including tractor trailers. When deployed, these technologies should dramatically reduce rear-end crashes, save more than 500 lives, and prevent nearly 33,000 injuries per year. NHTSA has also proposed significant upgrades to our five-star safety ratings program, that's NCAP, and we completed a bill directive in February 2022 when we issued our final adaptive driving beam rule. We're also working closely with the states and especially those communities most significantly affected by traffic crashes. This includes both urban and rural areas. It's worth noting, for example, that while 20% of Americans live in rural areas, they accounted for 40% of all traffic fatalities in 2021. Every decision we put, make at NHTSA puts safety first, and this also informs our approach to emerging vehicle technologies, including automated driving systems, or ADS, and advanced driver assistance systems, or ADAS, too. Promoting innovation while prioritizing a strong safety culture is at the heart of NHTSA's work in this rapidly evolving sector. Innovation and safety need to go hand in hand. A robust safety culture builds public trust in advanced technologies and automated vehicles. We're using all of our authorities and research capabilities to ensure that we advance technologies that make vehicles and roadways safer. Finally, NHTSA takes its enforcement responsibilities very seriously. So far this year, we've opened 40 defect investigations, closed 28 investigations, and overseen more than 900 safety recalls of vehicles, car seats, tires, and other equipment. And you may have seen today's news that after an extensive investigation into hundreds of crashes involving autopilot, Tesla has agreed to recall the more than 2 million vehicles on the roads in the United States. Our Office of Odometer Fraud has opened 13 criminal investigations this year. NHTSA is a small agency with a big mission and safety is at the heart of everything we do. They care very deeply about the safety of every person who uses our roads, no matter if they drive, walk, bike, ride, or roll. They all deserve uh, to arrive home to their loved ones 
safe and sound at the end of every day. I thank the committee for its support of NHTSA's life-saving mission, and I look forward to answering your questions and continuing to work with you to save lives on America's roads. Thank you. I thank all the witnesses for their testimony. We'll now begin the member question portion of our hearing today. I will recognize myself for five minutes and start with Administrator Bott. The Federal Highway Administration recently released a final rule to require states and metropolitan planning organizations to establish a new performance measure with declining targets for carbon dioxide emissions attributed to the national highway system. It pursued this final rule despite the fact that Congress considered but ultimately excluded such a provision during IGA negotiations. How can you continue to claim that imposing a greenhouse gas emissions uh, performance measure is consistent with the law or intent of Congress given the fact that it wasn't considered or it was considered and ultimately excluded from IGA? Well, thank you, Chairman, for the question. I want to be clear we're always consistent and follow the law. Uh, and in this case, our authority, as is laid out uh, in the rulemaking, comes from MAP 21. We track about 17 measures, given the authority that Congress has measured. So we're using that authority to now track environmental sustainability of the system, which is expressly called out in MAP 21. So not only was uh, GHD requirement sought and rejected during IGA negotiations, but also such a requirement was previously included and later omitted from legislation that was the basis for the Inflation Reduction Act. If the administration believes that it's, it has existing authority to impose this GHG requirement, then why does the administration continue to seek this authority through legislation? Uh, uh, Chair, thank you for that. Um, I wasn't part of the negotiations. I would just say from my state experience as the Secretary of Transportation in Delaware and in Colorado, we dealt with two hurricanes during my time in Delaware. We dealt with fires and floods in Colorado tornadoes in Tennessee and Kentucky during my time there. So I think it's uh, pretty obvious that from an infrastructure perspective, we're dealing with uh, climate from infrastructure from the 20th century that is not consistent with our climate in the 21st century. So what we're asking states to do is to begin tracking, uh, without penalizing them, but uh, track the, uh, the amount of GHG that comes from their transportation systems. So just, just to be clear, this particular point was specifically addressed in the IJA proceedings, in both the House and the Senate, it was specifically rejected as a part of the final package. And yet you're citing a previous authority under MAP 21. So does that mean that you can pick and choose when we pass a new law that supersedes the old law, that if, if you can basically pick and choose, well, we don't like this particular provision, so we're going to go back to a previous iteration of an authorization that allows us some authority that we do like. Is, am I understanding that correctly? Uh, Chairman, uh, just, just to be clear, we're following the law um, that was laid out in MAP 21. Okay. So I would say that the measure um, that allows us to measure 17 performance measures that we so have. So you're following MAP 21? We're using the authority granted to the department under MAP 21. Even though IJA is a reauthorization, so this looks to me like an, um, a deliberate attempt to sort of skirt the intent of IJA, which was expressly addressed, and that particular provision was taken out and not considered as the final passage was, was on the floor of the House and on the floor of the Senate. But you guys have gone back to MAP 21 as your underlying uh, authority to implement something that was expressly refused in the current authorization. So that's what I want to make sure that we understand that correctly. Let me move on to another topic. Um, uh, Ms. Carlson, I, I have a memo here from Mr. Earl Adams, the chief counsel at FMCSA, uh, and you were copied on that regarding the issue of pulsating brake lights. So these are uh, aftermarket addition of vehicles and commercial trucks. I ask unanimous consent to enter this memo into the record without objection, so ordered. The memo is about granting waivers for the use of pulsating brake lights on commercial trucks. The memo says, quote, the available data indicate that the product will not result in an adverse impact on safety, but rather will help reduce rear end crashes, end quote. It goes on to say that, quote, an equivalent or greater level of safety is likely to be achieved, end quote. Finally, the memo makes clear that within FMCSA safety mission and available data that a waiver is warranted for the use of pulsating brake lights. My question for you, Ms. Carlson, is since uh, um, FMCSA 
this issue with some, uh, sees this issue with some clarity, believes in the general safety of pulsating brake lights, and mentioned in the memo that this is willing to work, uh, that it was willing to work with uh, NHTSA. Why is NHTSA preventing the industry from receiving a waiver to install pulsating brake lights on trucks, which would likely prevent rear end accidents and make our roads safer? I appreciate the question, uh, uh, Chairman. Uh, let me start by saying that NHTSA has a Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standard 108 that requires steady burning lights. And that's a requirement that needs to be followed by manufacturers and dealers. It does not prevent the manufacturer of uh, pulsating lights, but it does prevent their installation by our OEMs and by dealers. So you can make them, you just can't use them. Uh, individuals can install them on their vehicles as long as it's consistent with state law, but they cannot be installed by manufacturers or by dealers because that would violate a rulemaking that was based on a safety conclusion that steady burning lights mm -hmm. provide a steady and consistent signal to drivers so that they know when a vehicle is stopped. Okay, I've run out of time, but despite the fact that the data that, that you're aware of and that exists, that you're still saying that that can't happen, so uh, again not necessarily demonstrating great commitment to safety on the highways with that ruling. Uh, I now turn to Ms. Norton for five minutes. This question is for uh, Mr. Bott and Ms. Carlson. Uh, our nation is experiencing an epidemic of traffic fatalities, including alarming increases in pedestrian and bicyclist fatalities. What does the Biden administration believe is causing this spike in fatalities, and what concrete actions is the department taking to save lives? Ms. Bott and Mr. Ms. Carlson. Uh, thank you, um, Ranking Member Norton. Uh, you know, one of the things I'm most proud of in my career was when I was uh, with the De Delaware Department of Transportation. We went from 23rd to 4th in bicycle-friendly states uh, because we recognize active transportation uh, is a critical part of, a, of our transportation network and making sure that people can do it safely. Um, you know, when you look into the data, it's, uh, you know, it's, and this is what Secretary Buttigieg has asked us to do under the NRSS, uh, is to look at a safe system approach. So there's speeds, there's distracted driving, uh, there's infrastructure, one of our 28 uh, proven safety countermeasures at FHWA are protected bike lanes. And we're also working with states to identify vulnerable road user studies in their states. And so we look forward to working with them with that data. And I'll turn it over to Administ uh, Acting Administrator Carson. Uh, thank you, Cong Congresswoman Norton. Uh, let me start uh, answering your question about what do we think is the cause by providing some data and some potential explanations. So one of the things we know is that 70% of pedestrians are killed at night. And uh, most of them are adults. Child, uh, pedestrian fatalities among children have actually declined pretty dramatically. Um, we also know that most of those are not at intersections. And uh, as my colleague uh, Shaylin said, you know, one of the things that we're really focused on is infrastructure, sidewalks, for example, lighting could be a huge improvement. Um, we also know that people are speeding, uh, and, and the high, you know, obviously if you're hit at higher speeds, you're much less likely to survive a, a pedestrian crash. Uh, and drivers are, are driving distracted much more frequently. So we're working on all of those things, but let me give you two examples of things that NHTSA is doing to address pedestrian fatalities. Um, one of the most important is our proposed rulemaking for pedestrian automatic emergency braking that would provide vehicles with technology that would identify a pedestrian that the driver didn't have time to see and would also work at night. It would be an extraordinary uh, advancement in, in safety technology and we project it would save hundreds of lives and prevent thousands of injuries. In addition, we have both a proposed rulemaking and a proposal in our new car assessment program, that's the five-star rating program, to um, add pedestrian protection to vehicles in the event that a pedestrian is actually hit. Uh, it's a gruesome thought, but actually vehicles can be made to absorb more energy and therefore lessen the injuries to both legs and heads as a result of crashes. And then of course, working with our state partners who receive um, uh, Highway Safety Grants, DC got a, a little over $5 million, for example, uh, to address the, the problematic areas where pedestrian fatalities are occurring, using data to figure out where are the worst intersections, are there lighting problems, are there infrastructure problems, and then using our safe system approach to try to tackle that problem with every single tool we have. 
Ms. Ms. Uh, Hutchinson, uh, one area of concern I hear from my constituents is household goods moving scams. Far too often, people going through a move are taken advantage of and have their property held hostage or lost forever. Uh, this can be devastating uh, as it can include the loss of irreplaceable family heirlooms. The FAST Act created the Household Goods Consumer Protection Working Group within the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration. I plan to introduce a bill in the new year that will grant the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration additional authorities to conduct household goods enforcement. Can you describe the agency's ongoing efforts to address moving scams and educate consumers who are working to move? Who are looking to move. Thank you, Ranking Member Norton, for the opportunity to talk about this. I've heard gut-wrenching stories from people who have lost everything in household moving scams, people lose their whole lives, their memories. It is a deeply personal issue. At the beginning of this year, we launched a strategic action plan. Part of that is Operation Protect Your Move that was rolled out this spring. We've increased awareness. We've stepped up um, our uh, investigations, uh, completing more and more as we go. And as a result, we've uh, closed 700 complaints and we've had a 36% reduction in the number of consumer complaints coming in. Um, we're, we're not going to stop until you know, we bring these numbers down of the complaints that come in. And, and just for anyone who has suffered from this or plans to move, please do check our Protect Your Move website where you can find information on how to move uh, uh, your goods yourselves safely without experiencing this fraud. Thank you. I yield back. The gentleman yields. Um, Mr. Bost. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Administration Trader Hutchinson, the FMCSA has proposed a rule to limit the speed of commercial vehicles throughout the agency's proposed uh, throughout the agency proposal, you refer to the research of Dr. Uh, Stephen Johnson at the University of Arkansas. However, Dr. Johnson's conclusion seemed to be a little different than yours. His research showed that when the speed of the vehicle is different from the average speed of other vehicles, intersections between, in, intersection between vehicles increase and so does the chance for an accident. In fact, the chance is increased to 220% higher if the vehicle is going 10 mile per hour slower than the speed limit. Dr. Johnson even said if the speed limiter regulation is implemented, it is important to note that it will occur on the basis of supported opinion rather than the de uh, de def definitive, definitive value, valid and reliable uses of data. Has your agency considered any research to determine what types of crashes to, would be increased when the agency creates or expands a speed limiter mandate? Thank you, Representative, for raising this important issue. Um, the National Roadway Safety Strategy identifies speed as something that needs to be addressed. And in fact, in truck crashes, speed is one of the leading uh, reasons why there are fatalities on our highways, very often including drivers themselves. Um, the NTSB has determined that speed uh, was a contributing factor in not just one, but uh, many, but a chief among them, a tragic crash in Pennsylvania where four people lost their lives and 50 people were injured. Um, as you, I believe you are aware, we are uh, uh, working through a rulemaking process. We've received numerous comments um, and have heard about this research about um, what is called a speed differential. And so I, I thank you for raising it. Um, the regulatory impact, we have not yet published a uh, notice of proposed rulemaking. It is still in agency review. Um, and the regulatory impact analysis will consider the research and this uh, issue specifically. Okay, well, let me, let me tell you the advantage of having a representative form of government, and many of us are actually in other industries around before we come here. Grew up in the trucking business, know it well. Uh, I know there's one other member that also, but he's not here today, uh, does the same thing. I have two questions that are of concern, and I'm just gonna express them, because I know you've probably never drove a tractor trailer up and down the highway, but that's just an assumption, maybe you have. 
But the prob- there's two problems. One, in the state of Illinois, when I was in the state legislature, the problem was is that we had one limit for trucks and one limit for cars. And we did discover through our research that it actually caused more wrecks than it would if it would just flow of traffic would have worked. Now, the other problem that you have is if you have a, a driver who is a skilled driver and all of a sudden he's going to get in a situation and you have now limited his ability to use speed to react to get away and protect while driving a vehicle, you have changed the vehicle dynamics and therefore you're endangering people rather than saving them by making it to where you have a limiter that doesn't allow the, a, a professional driver to make decisions to try to either speed up to get out of the way or speed up to go around a situation that might be occurring in front of them. So that's something I think you should consider as well. Now I got a second question that I wanna ask because it's a completely different question, okay? Um, you know, you've heard motor, I've heard a lot of motor carriers right now uh, that, that freight fraud is involved real, really bad with scammers. Uh, and let me tell you how this works. We have people who are out there that are claiming to be brokers. Uh, the truck drivers are out there trying to find loads or their companies are trying to find loads for them. They, they use this broker. The broker all of a sudden comes in. It gets in the middle of the, of the supply chain issue and they broker the load. Now, by the time that driver then gets back in or that company gets that load back in and ready to be paid for, they contact that particular company and they are no longer in existence or you can no longer find them. Is there anything that your agency is doing and can be dealing with as far as the fraud that is occurring out there because we're losing a tremendous amount of smaller companies and or, uh, uh, and or owner operators because it's one thing if a great big company takes a $2,000 loss or $5,000 loss, but the smaller companies can't take that. Representative, I appreciate your experience in the industry. We unequivocally share your concerns about the impact of fraud um, on the industry and specifically broker fraud. Um, we are taking steps. First and foremost, we issued a financial responsibility rule that will uh, ensure security limits for brokers and freight forwarders is increased to $75,000. We know that's not enough. We are also taking steps to improve transparency and transactions. We've been listening to our stakeholders working very closely with OIDA, uh, TAA, and others. Thank you for Th Thank you, and my time is expired. Are you back? Jimlin Yields, Mr. Larson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, first, I want to say, for fear of being maybe criticized later, <clears throat> we're nearly an hour in this conversation, and no one yet has just said, stop spending money out of the BIL and creating jobs in my district. So good job to this uh, US DOT with the BIL implementation, creating jobs, getting those benefits and projects out uh, into the district. Um, now, having said that, um, I have a few questions. Uh, first off, for Ms. Carlson, you mentioned your testimony regarding the Tesla recall on auto steer. Can you describe the action, briefly describe actions uh, NHTSA took to, uh, or a, yeah, uh, your agency took to leading up to the, to the filing of, a, of the recall notice, please? On the microphone, please. Thank you, yes, I appreciate the question. Let me start uh, by acknowledging that a number of people have died in Tesla crashes where autopilot was, uh, uh, was on, and frequently those crashes involved what appeared to be a driver not realizing that there was an obstacle that appeared kind of suddenly in front of it. And when I kept hearing about Tesla crashes, my immediate response is we have to do something about this. So in August of 2021, the agency launched an investigation. I want to just give you a sense for the complexity of the investigation. I've got two more questions for others. Okay, so I'll be quick. be quick. Okay, yeah. thank you. So um, we examined over 900 crashes. 322 of those involved uh, frontal impact crashes and things that where autopilot was engaged. And one of the things we determined is that drivers were not always paying attention when that system was on. And so Tesla has agreed to the recall. We appreciate that they've agreed to it. And let me just, I'll just read what it says and then I'll stop. Um, it says that its software system may not be sufficient to prevent driver misuse. And so they will be issuing remedies to address that problem, that problem where the interaction between the system and the driver is not sufficiently uh, attuned to, to the fact that the driver could just tune out when he or she is driving. All right, thanks. That's much broader implications beyond what Tesla's doing as well um, long in the future when it comes to uh, using this technology for any, any vehicle. Absolutely. Passenger or otherwise. Absolutely. Thanks. Uh, Mr. Bott, 
uh, the BIL takes climate change seriously. Uh, it provides seven and a half billion for EV charging infrastructure, uh, but the build out has been, uh, you know, frankly, pretty slow on the EV charge, the federal dollars for EV chargers. Um, can you provide an update on the rollout of this funding and where we're gonna be going to, to move this rollout on EV charging more quickly? Thank you, uh, Ranking Member Larson. Yes, absolutely. I would say that uh, we have uh, taken two years to stand up the program. The, we know that Ohio opened up the first uh, federally funded electric charger uh, last week. Uh, New York is gonna join later this week. Uh, Maine, Vermont, Pennsylvania, uh, Hawaii is coming soon. So I would say that uh, we are um, expecting uh, thousands of chargers to be coming online. So sure. why, why the pace? Um, didn't, we didn't expect it on day one, but why, why day 730? There's $1.2 trillion in the bipartisan infrastructure law. One in four of those dollars flows through uh, federal highways. And so of that $7.5 billion on NEVI, we've had to write rules, work with states, work with the private sector, set up a joint office with uh, DOE um, so we can do this right the first time. Uh, and that's what we're doing. Continue, need to continue to watch that very closely. Ms. Fernandez, uh, we talked in the past about ferries, um, luxury ferries, uh, in fact, at the uh, gra groundbreaking or some, some, some event in, in Linwood, Washington recently. Um, you've awarded funds for seven projects so far for, for, this, uh, for electric or low emitting uh, ferries. Um, we have the largest system in the country measured by people moved and vehicles moved. Uh, what other kind of interests are you seeing in that program and are there some lessons learned or policy challenges that we need to consider as we look forward? Uh, thank you very much for your question, uh, Ranking Member Larson. Uh, our, our ferry programs are critical uh, to coastal communities and the new programs that were created in the uh, bipartisan infrastructure law really uh, fund around the low emitting uh, electric ferry will really help improve and uh, also help expand service uh, while supporting the environmental goals of the communities. On the ferry, uh, low emitting ferry uh, program, we stood up that program very quickly. Uh, just uh, last week, I um, issued the release of the of grant awards for the second round, uh, 220 million uh, to 13 uh, projects in eight states. And those dollars are going to start uh, a revolution, a transformation of the ferry program. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, the, uh, the first U.S. electric ferry is being built right now in the state of Rhode Island in Providence uh, by a company, uh, Sinesco. And that will be the, uh, the beginning of, of manufacturing on low em emitting ferries that will then help transit agencies that in fact have ferries as part of their mobility option to be able to get those out and deployed. Great, thank you, Ms. Uh, Ms. Chair. I just know it might be the first in the US, but it's not first in the world. There are plenty of electric ferries being operated around the country. This isn't science fiction, it's real, and it's about time US caught up with it. So with that, I yield back. Gentleman yields, Mr. Johnson. Thank you. Uh, of course, there are a, a number of important investments being made as a part of the infrastructure package. We do wanna make sure that those investments don't uh, strengthen our adversaries. Of course, you all are familiar with uh, LIDAR. It's a technology that uses later light, uh, uh, laser light uh, to map our surroundings. And we deploy this stuff in an in increasing measure across our transportation infrastructure. So airports, uh, ports, uh, intersections, of course, in autonomous vehicles. Uh, and as we make these massive investments in deploying this important technology, of course, we wanna make sure we aren't creating vulnerabilities for the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, most Americans probably don't realize the extent to which the Chinese Communist Party has used a number of tactics uh, to be a major market leader in this technology. They've identified some choke points that they have wanted to own, which gives them a certain amount of coercive power uh, over this infrastructure. Uh, and it's not just me uh, that shares these concerns. In fact, a recent uh, Congressional Research Service study indicated that yes, indeed, the Chinese Communist Party could use this exquisite uh, mapping capability to be able to gain uh, some additional power uh, and exploit these vulnerabilities. Uh, that's one reason why those, those of us on the uh, Select Committee on China yesterday morning uh, passed a report that called for us to try to de-risk 
uh, our exposure, our vulnerabilities to this uh, PRC used and PRC dominated uh, LIDAR technology. Of course, we want the technology. We just want to make sure we're investing in that technology in a way that does not strengthen our adversaries. Uh, so for the undersecretary, uh, for the administrator, uh, any thoughts on what DOT is doing to educate its team and contractors about the fact that we don't want to give the PRC any more coercive power over our country uh, in, uh, in how we deploy LIDAR? Thank you, Congressman. And uh, I'd love to turn it over to uh, Acting Administrator Carlson in a moment, but cybersecurity uh, and, and, and particularly in concern uh, with the People's Republic of China is spot on. Uh, we are in constant communication uh, with the national security team, uh, with the Treasury Department, uh, as they do CFIUS analyses of, uh, of different uh, transactions to make sure that as we're deploying this technology on our nation's roadways, uh, that, it, that, that, they are, uh, that they are resilient against attacks, which we see thousands and thousands a day. Uh, it's not only light, l LIDAR, it's also uh, the PNT, uh, uh, the, the signal that we get from space. Uh, uh, but we are, uh, again, in constant con communications, uh, and uh, Secretary Buttigieg has directed uh, our department, led by the research team uh, uh, under, the, under my organization, our OCIO, our, our, our chief information officer, uh, to make sure that we are tracking threats and helping our uh, OEM uh, partners do the same. So uh, let's try to get specific. And just in case people think that that uh, I, you know, either the undersecretary or I are, or I are fear mongering, I mean, here's the the independent nonpartisan uh, statement from the CRS: China could use data compiled by PRC lidar systems to acquire sensitive information or exquisite mapping of U.S. infrastructure. And we are really talking about exquisite. I mean, you think about every object in the transportation system, its location, its speed, uh, how all of these things fit together. I mean, what unbelievably detailed and frankly dangerous information about our transportation systems. So uh, are there specific actions that our government is taking to make sure that uh, we aren't just buying technology managed by the PRC and their partners. Uh, I think Anne wants to pipe in. I, I share your concern, and NHTSA has some authority, although I will say that there's more authority in other agencies across the federal government. One thing that we do is we uh, have a list that's been provided to us by other agencies of the uh, federal government that identifies those companies, those Chinese companies and other com companies around the world that pose a security risk and we prevent vehicles that have technology from those companies uh, from coming into the country. We have a relationship with the U.S. Customs Service and, and try to ensure that. We also work very closely with our automotive partners on cybersecurity. We uh, have something called the Auto ISAC, which is really a model for industry-wide cooperation in trying to reduce cybersecurity threats. I've spoken at the last two Auto ISAC national meetings in part to convey the importance of this issue. And we've been working closely with the Department of Commerce on these questions as well. Uh, again, we share your concerns. These are serious ones. Uh, Mr. Chairman, as I'm out of time, I would just note that I think that information is, heart is heartening from the automotive perspective. I do think ports, airports, we've got a lot of other work to do, and I look forward to working with our panelists on that, and I yield. Gentleman yields, Mr. Menendez. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you to our witnesses this morning uh, for their testimony highlighting the critical work made possible by the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. The impacts of AJA on New Jersey's infrastructure cannot be understated. In November, the FTA announced over $4 billion in grants for passenger rail in New Jersey's 8th Congressional District through a program authorized and funded by AJA. These funds will allow key parts of the Gateway Program to advance. I'm excited to see these projects benefit our district. I look forward to working with our witnesses today on further implementation of this critical legislation. Administrator Fernandez, earlier this year, I led a 114 member bipartisan letter urging the FTA to take action to protect public transit operators from assault. Your testimony noted that the FTA will soon be announcing a general directive on required actions regarding assaults on transit workers. I'm encouraged to see the FTA engage on this issue. Administrator Fernandez, can you speak more on this general directive and how it will aim to protect transit workers from assault? Representative Menendez, thank you so very much for that question. Uh, 
Uh, let me just begin by saying that the uh, attack on operators is unexcusable because these are the same individuals that were celebrated for being heroes during the, the pandemic. They got peep, they went to work so that people could get to their jobs, essential workers. Uh, Congress directed the Federal Transit Administration to create and to publish a, um, a rule on trans transit worker safety. From the first day of this administration, we have been on the on tap on moving forward with um, getting a publication on the way. But I will start by saying that Secretary Buttigieg uh, met with operators uh, his first week on the, on the job, and I have met not only with the operators, I have met with the labor union and with transit agencies. As a Federal Transit Administration, we take this very seriously, and not only do we have a rule underway, but we have, we're taking full advantage of the existing authorities that we have so that we can uh, direct transit agencies to implement uh, safety for their operators, uh, and we will be holding them accountable to do just that. And how can we uh, here in Congress be supportive in the FTA's efforts that you just um, discussed to protect transit workers, riders, pedestrians, and other roadway users? Uh, Representative, uh, again, thanks for that question. I think the beginning was, of course, uh, with the funding. In the bipartisan infrastructure law, there is funding that allows uh, transit agencies to use the formula dollars uh, for uh, introducing security measures into their system. They can hire security uh, officers, they can hire personnel, they can implement technology uh, on the security side. In addition to that, uh, they can do the training necessary. At the Federal Transit Administration, we have been implemented an initiative called uh, Transit Safety and Crime Prevention Initiative. In addition to that, we have been holding a series of trainings on de-escalation. The, and we've also invested funds in uh, developing a prototype for a, to protect uh, operators uh, in the, the driver's cab. So what we're doing is a holistic approach. Uh, we know that there's more to be done, but we, uh, transit agencies have a responsibility to protect the people that work uh, for them. Also, as they protect those individuals, they're protecting the public that's using the system. Absolutely, and we look forward to partnering with you and advancing those initiatives. Under Secretary Monet, State Department of Transportation are working to address a wide variety of issues from road maintenance to tolling. In my district in New Jersey, we have seen reports of toll evasion through fraudulent license plates. Several states have acted to address this issue by passing laws to crack down on toll evaders. One barrier to addressing fare evasion is a lack of updated information technology at DMVs. For example, the state of New York can suspend registration from habitual toll violators, but an outside entity had to help their DMVs create a new IT software. Under Secretary, how is the Department of Transportation help in helping states modernize their DMVs? Uh, thank you so much, Congressman. And uh, I, um, I'd love to turn it over actually to my colleagues, if it's okay with you, uh, who more directly work with uh, DMVs, perhaps Robin uh, Hutchison. Sure. Uh, but one of the, the, the really wonderful things that, that uh, Congress did in a bipartisan way is give us money in order to partner with our states to up their game. But perhaps uh, Administrator Hutchison could, could answer better than I can. Hit your mic, a quick thank answer, Thank you, please. Representative, and thank you uh, to my colleague, uh, Mr. Monhey, for passing it to me. Uh, we, we have issued a a tremendous amount of grant money to states through the bipartisan infrastructure law. Um, while our lens is commercial motor vehicles, I can say that these grants have been used by states to expedite issuance of CDLs, of course, that's our lens, but also to improve their IT systems, to increase accuracy and timeliness of traffic convictions, suspensions, and disqualifying information. Um, that is for CDL holders. Uh, and this ultimately will help keep all drivers safe on our nation's roadways. I appreciate that. We saw it at my time at the Port Authority, and it's a big issue, especially as we look at funding for um, State Department transportation agencies. Thank you. I yield back. Yep. Gentlemen's time has expired. Um, uh, Ms. Malloy. My first question is for Mr. Bott, and it concerns project delivery times. Um, in your written testimony, you said the time's money, 
and that's why you're committed to helping deliver projects in a timely manner. I'm hearing from people in my district that projects are getting more and more expensive while they're waiting for permitting. What are you doing to streamline permitting so that projects don't get prohibitively expensive between the time the grant is awarded and when it can be built? Thank you, Representative uh, Malloy, and, and time is money, and absolutely we want to get these projects underway and under construction. On the permitting side, uh, Federal Highways is not a permitting uh, agency, but we work very closely with the permitting agencies and the state sponsors um, so that we can quickly turn uh, any permitting needs that are in place uh, to get those permits issued and get those projects under construction. Okay, thank you. Ms. Fernandez, I have a similar question for you. I'm hearing that, that the NEPA process is slowing down the grants, even with the increased funding from IIJA. Um, what is your agency doing to make sure that these permitting processes are moving so that projects can be built before they become too expensive? Uh, thank you very much for your question, uh, Representative Malloy. The Federal Transit Administration is working very closely with every single one of our project sponsors and those who intend to uh, request federal funding for their projects. Uh, one of the uh, areas uh, that I would like to emphasize is that 99% of the projects that come before us receive a categorical exclusion. That is, these are projects that are not affecting the, the human environment and therefore do not are not subject uh, to uh, the going through an environmental assessment process. That helps expedite, get projects out uh, sooner. Uh, we are also working across the Department of Transportation on the permitting action plan so that we can get all projects. Uh, many of our projects have interfaces with other modes of transportation and getting all of those projects out on time. Thank you. Okay, last question, Ms. Hutchison. The Safe Driver App Apprenticeship Program. I'm hearing that there are requirements that are being required by the agency that aren't in IIJA, and it's making it difficult to fill all of the slots. What are you doing to address that? Are you considering removing the additional requirements? Thank you, Representative Malloy, for the question. Um, our responsibility is to safety first. We've been uh, rolling out the Safe Driver Apprenticeship Program um, as directed by Congress, and we are in the process of uh, building the ranks of drivers in order to complete uh, the, the 200 drivers we need to have a statistically significant study. Um, we've included uh, safety requirements as directed by Congress. Congress gave us authority for the Department of Transportation to add safety measures um, as necessary to ensure safety. Um, and we have done that. We continue to market, communicate, reach out, and build these ranks, and we look forward to reporting back to you on a successful program soon. Okay, I look forward to the report. Thank you, I yield back. Gentleman yields, uh, Mr. Cohen. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, and Ranking Member Norton for holding this hearing. It's important that the public knows about what we've passed and how it's being implemented. Uh, since the passage of the historic bipartisan infrastructure law, the Department of Transportation has grants under 103 programs for roads, bridges, rail, buses, ferries, ports, pipelines, and more. All the type of uh, activities that the government is supposed to do, basic fundamentals and infrastructure, things the public appreciates and um, use, utilizes, and that are bipartisan in nature. There are projects in every congressional district across the country, including districts, uh, in the districts of members who even voted against this bill. Uh, so far, $6.2 billion in, in funding has been announced and is headed to Tennessee with over 266 specific projects identified for funding. In my district in 2023, we've received $140 million in federal aid highway funds, which is supporting 47 new projects in addition to the 48 projects from 2022. We appreciate that. Since passage of the bill, we have received several discretionary grants as well. Ms. Fernandez was with us when we announced $76.3 million in FTA grants to the Memphis Area Transit Authority, uh, MATA. And we had $38.2 million in raised grants for MATA's Crosstown Quarter Project and Shelby County's Project Talbo, 14.8 for the Memphis Airport for the Terminal Expansion Program, and $640,000 for safe streets for uh, all grants to the city of Memphis. So it's important what it's done for my district and districts all over the country. Uh, to Mr. Is it Monahe? Uh, Monahe, thank you for asking. Monahe, I'm sorry. Thank you, sir. 
speaking of my district, uh, I'd like to make you aware of a program that Chairman Crawford somehow or another did not mention. Um, it's an application for a grant under the Bridge Investment Program. Gentlemen's time's expired. <laughs> <laughs> he wants this as much as I do. It's an $800 million application jointly submitted by Tennessee and Arkansas to replace the I-55 bridge with a new bridge called America's River Crossing. $400 million would come from this grant and $200 million from the Department of Transportation in Arkansas and $200 million from Tennessee. Um, that, that bridge crosses the Mississippi River. Lots of I-40 traffic, uh, I-55 traffic all throughout the country. Uh, this is an important new bridge, and the old bridge was built in 1949. So it's not, not an old time for a person, but an old time for a bridge. Um, it's important for the Port of Memphis, which is the fifth largest inland port in the United States as well. Uh, it's not seismically safe, uh, and we need to have a resilient bridge that does that. Um, so we'd appreciate the department's due consideration when reviewing this grant application. Are you familiar with that grant application? Yes, sir. Uh, and. Uh the great thing about the bill, the bridge uh, program is that uh, there's statutory minimums uh, for each state, uh, and uh, uh, Shailen uh, has met with uh, Tennessee uh, DOT uh, on this project. Uh, the, we, we are able to, to take these uh, bottlenecks and move them from the wish list to the construction schedule. Well, it would be important for all the world, as I t mentioned to, to Secretary Buttigieg, a mantra should be, it's good for Memphis, it's good for the country. Yes, sir. And, and this is certainly good for the, we fly everything in and out of the airport on FedEx, and then you come across the, the I-40 bridge or the I-55 bridge, and you get all the truck transportation and commerce. Uh, Ms. Fernandez, thank you again. It's good to see you again. Uh, I know Matt is appreciative of what we had in the past, and as you know, transit agencies in most urbanized areas like Memphis can only use their federal funds for capital projects, expenditures. Um, so states have to, and localities spend their all for operating, 100% on the hook for operating expenses. The Biden administration tried to change that, but it didn't make it into the law. How important is, do you believe it is for large transit agencies in major urbanized areas like Memphis to be able to access federal funds for operating expenses? Thank you very much for your question, uh, Representative Cohen, and, and th also thank you for your focus on the new bus facility in Memphis uh, that was sinking and that now has funding uh, to be rebuilt. Um, as, you, <clears throat> as you may know, uh, currently large urban transit uh, systems cannot use uh, Federal Transit Administration funds uh, for operations the way that smaller and rural uh, systems can. And that's one of the reasons why in the President's 2024 budget, uh, he requested that Congress enact um, that it would increase uh, local providers' flexibility to use those funds when they need to. Uh, while we, of course, defer to Congress, I certainly agree that um, it would be helpful to transit agencies, and in particular those that are facing a, a challenge with their closing the gaps in their operating budgets. Uh, currently, uh, rural communities are able to use um, their formula dollars for operations, and we, transit is a so, such an integral part, it's so um, essential uh, to, people around this country that it is imperative that they continue to have uh, access to that service. And uh, that access uh, comes in the, fund, in the way of um, funding to operate the services. I, I believe I'm correct. Matta goes into West Memphis even, in the, Mr. Crawford's district. But in closing, uh, Administrator Blatt, we got a city of Memphis got a Safe Streets for All grant, but we'll con need to continue funding to keep that going and get down to uh, zero losses of life. So Appreciate that effort, too, and I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields. Mr. Nels. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Administrator Hutchinson, uh, the FMCSA is considering a number of regulations that are in various stages you know, of the rulemaking process, including a potential speed limiter mandate on the large trucks, big, big trucks. Now, I know you may not be able to comment in detail about the substance of the final rule, but but I hope you would agree with me that a, that a credible process is very, very important, particularly when uh, working through controversial rulemakings. Would you agree we need to get this right? Yes? Yeah, yeah. Representative oh. Nels, yes, I agree. Very good. Processes. Okay. So this is, this is why it concerns me. This is what concerns me, that in late September, FMCSA included a specified or a specific speed limit for the speed limiter rule, 68 miles an hour. It was in the uh, USDOT unified agenda. 
This was quickly rescinded and chalked up as a clerical error. Did you know about that? Uh, 68 right. miles an hour, USDOT. It's a clerical error. However, the same week, I believe that you were a keynote speaker at a high dollar fundraiser. They, they dubbed it as a soiree sponsored by label, uh, labor unions, trial attorneys, large trucking companies. All of these stakeholders have been pressuring your agency to select a speed limiter rule set at 60 miles an hour, well below what the agency had indicated it was prepared to select. Uh, were these two occurrences connected in any way? Representative, I appreciate the opportunity to make clarifications here. We have not yet set a speed limit, and we have not issued an NPRM in which that speed limit would be suggested for feedback. Do, do you believe that it hurts the credibility of rulemaking process by attending, you know, keynoting a, a fundraiser for advocates on one side of the issue while the regulation is under consideration? Uh, Representative, we take very seriously the fidelity of the process of rulemaking, and we don't discuss the contents of the rule even as we're engaging okay. with our stakeholders right. around the I'll country. trust you on this. I'm going to trust you on this, but I just hope that, that you equally consider the 15,000 comments, 15,000 comments from America's truckers who have provided input on this rulemaking. Uh, they're not going to be able to host a big fundraiser for you, but are you familiar with Landline Magazine? You familiar with this? Representative, I am. It's very good magazine. Do you read it or do you just get it or it sits on your desk or do you read this? This uh, is the October 2023 issue, page 12. Very dangerous, very dangerous. It says here talking about the, uh, the, uh, the speed limiters on this thing. Uh, read this article because I tell you, the people that travel around and I think you mentioned earlier that, that truckers are moving a lot of our goods and service around. Listen to the truckers. I think they would know better than the bureaucrats and specifically Congress on this. Uh, the AEB rule, I'd like to pivot to that. I believe NHTSA, FMCSA has gone far beyond congressional intent to include vehicles for which AEB technology is not practical. Vocational, emergency vehicles, the rule uh, was written is not implementable. I don't believe it is. Vocational vehicles are not completed on our factory lines. The chassis is sent to third-party uh, third customization shops where heavy equipment is added, like a dump truck with a big stove plow in front of it. Manufacturers would not be able to certify the system once the vehicle is altered, which can lead to a misleading understanding of AEB for the operator. Uh, Ms. Carlson, are you, you familiar with this magazine? I don't. Oh. But I will. you got to read the magazine. You recommend it highly. The whole industry, everybody's driving up. Very dangerous. So why do trucks say an emergency, uh, automatic emergency brake mandate would jeopardize safety? It talks about one of the truck drivers that it was either a shadow or the guardrail caused her to lose control in this thing. Scared the hell out of her. Matter of fact, I got a little Lexus, you know, and I was backing up out of the grocery store, the HEB, the other day, and all of a sudden the damn thing slammed the brakes and scared me, scared my wife. I said, what the heck's happening? Well, this thing must have detected a vehicle coming from my left or my right. This can be very, very dangerous. And, and if you read this, and I would, matter of fact, I'll give you this copy Thank once you. I'm done. You need to read this when it talks about these, these breaks and how dangerous it's going to be. If let's I might. Get into, let's get into uh, uh, what's really important as well as my Trucker Access Act. Would you mind if I responded to I, it? I, I just got another 20 seconds here. Uh, okay. Are you guys, Ms. Carlson, Ms. Hutchinson, are you familiar with my access to Trucker Bathroom Access Act. Are you familiar with that? Representative, I am. Oh, very good. Uh, is the administrative supportive of the principal behind my bill? Uh, representative, we are. We believe in dignified working conditions. I love that. I love that. And all the truckers running around trying to find a way to relieve themselves and find a bathroom to go to. I mean, it just makes sense. We should provide access to bathrooms for these truckers. Easier for fellas just to go behind a truck. But what about a lady? What's a lady going to do? She's got to have access to a bathroom. Uh, do you have any data or ways to uh, uh, accumulate data for truck drivers um, that were denied bathroom access or anything like that? Quick anything? answer on this. Can Representative, your office has reached out to mine for technical Beautiful. assistance, and we look forward to continuing to assist. I'm glad that you support it. I'll, I'll support you on this and do everything we can to make sure that our Truckers have a place to relieve themselves in the right way, legally. Thank you. I yield back. The gentleman yields, Mr. Stanton. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Carlson, uh, did you have a short answer you wanted to give uh, uh, Brees Apostle? 
Thank you so much. I appreciate the opportunity. I did just want to say that we've received comments on our proposed rulemaking. We consider every one of those comments carefully. Some of them are reflected in the article that you referred to, and uh, we will uh, issue a, a final rule that takes into account those comments. Thank you. Thank you much. Uh, successful implementation of the bipartisan infrastructure, infrastructure law is our shared priority. Every corner of my state of Arizona is benefiting from these investments, and my district is no exception. More than $220 million has been allocated to reconstruct and expand the I-10 Broadway curve, one of the most heavily traveled sections of freeway in the region. And recently, both the cities of Flagstaff and Globe received Safe Streets for and Roads for All funding, a competitive grant program authorized by BIL with the goal of getting us to zero roadway death. This is our bipartisan work in action to keep our communities safe. Even with these significant investments, there is still much more to do and projects that desperately need federal support to become a reality. One of the most important is the expansion of I-10 in Arizona. Arizona has invested wisely in widening I-10 because it is a major artery for passenger and freight traffic in the southern United States. While the majority of I-10 between Phoenix and Tucson has been widened, there is one significant gap that remains only two lanes and it lies wholly within the boundaries of the Gila River Indian community. And I doubt it would surprise any of us that the improved portions of the I-10 end at the Indian community boundary and pick up on the other side of the Indian community boundary because for decades, centuries even, tribal governments have not been treated equitably as partners in federal transportation projects. Widening I-10 and adding an interchange is vital to improve safety, provide direct access to the Gila River Indian Community's government services and hospital, accelerate response time for emergency services, and it will prevent traffic from detouring onto the reservation when bottlenecks or accidents close or otherwise restrict traffic. All priorities for modal administrators like yourselves, and I am hopeful that I-10 can finally receive the federal grant funding to move ahead for this much needed expansion. Mr. Bott, on that theme of pending success and implementation, I wanna to turn to you. Included in the BIL was the ROCKS Act. This is a bipartisan effort that I led to establish a working group at DOT to examine and draft policies to ensure we have sustainable access to construction materials. My home state of Arizona has led the way in enacting policies like the ROCKS Act that keep prices low and ensure more sustainable options are available as we work to build the infrastructure funded by BIL. It's my understanding that FHA is working to implement this important provision and establish the federal working group created by the ROCKS Act, but it is still not moved. Can you provide context on this and will you investigate this important issue, work with your team to implement the working group uh, on covered resources? Thank you, Representative uh, Stanton. I actually was in Arizona last week uh, for a wildlife crossing award announcement and met with our team at the Broadway Curve office uh, and absolutely on the ROCKS Act. Uh, and actually, Director Toth also mentioned uh, the I-10 project to me. I will absolutely uh, work with you in your office on getting that uh, stood up. Yeah, that's the ROCKS Act is important and it just has, it's been slow to move the working group. We need to get it done. Thank you for uh, investigating that and getting back to my office. I'm short on time, but I want to end on Another success, the build out of light rail infrastructure in the Valley of the Sun, specifically the Northwest Expansion Phase Two project. I used to be mayor of Phoenix and we put on the ballot uh, support for light rail and other public transportation improvements back in 2015. It passed overwhelmingly. My own reelection happened on the same ballot and we won as well. So it was a good day in, uh, uh, in Phoenix and now it's coming to fruition. This project will extend light rail west on Dunlap Avenue from 19th Avenue, north on 25th Avenue and across I-17 at Mountain View Road, ending on the west side of the freeway near the former Metro Center Mall. This project was the first CIG project to receive a full funding grant agreement under the Biden administration, and the ribbon cutting is next month. So I'm gonna extend a personal invitation to you, Ms. Fernandez, to join us in Arizona for this important celebration. I hope you can make it. Thank you very much, uh, Representative Stanton. I hope I can make it too. We're gonna work, make it work in your schedule. Thank you so much and I yield back. Gentleman yields, uh, Mr. LaMalfa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you panelists for joining us here today and um, bringing us uh, information and testimony that will help. Um, now, 
we know that um, in my home state of California, as well as here at the federal level, there's a lot of conversation about um, reducing emissions and uh, greenhouse gas, and most specifically, it seems to boil down to uh, carbon dioxide and the uh, there's goals being set for that and targets, et cetera. So um, I know each of you probably looking at different aspects of those goals. I would say it's probably pretty fair, right? So um, let me ask each of you, let's, so in order to set goals, what is the basis where we're starting at? So I'd like to ask each of you just to go down the line, please. What percent of our atmosphere currently is carbon dioxide? Let's start with you. Uh, right, on, right on the left, Ms. Manji. I'm not 100% sure, but I would imagine about 3-ish percent. Okay, three. thank you. Mr. Bott? Uh, I think it's actually 0.04%. Okay. Uh, Ms. Fernandez? I, I would go with 0.04%. Uh, okay. Uh, Ms. Hutchinson? As beyond our safety mission, I don't have a number for you. Okay. And finally, Ms. Carlson? I don't as well, but I will say that that percentage is increasing. Is what? That percentage is increasing as we emit more greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. Okay. All right. It's important to know where you're starting on that. And so two of you, I commend on knowing the number, 0.04%. And uh, it has, uh, it is creeping up. So four, four one hundredths of 1% is where we're starting. So as our atmosphere is made up of 98, excuse me, 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, a little under 1% argon, and carbon dioxide is mixed in with methane, nitrous oxide, krypton, and water vapor in the trace gases that is in there. So uh, indeed, I don't personally believe that carbon dioxide is the enemy. It's very essential for plant life, which if we are gonna have the production of oxygen we need, we need plants around. So, so that said, um, it's even listed on your website that under climate and sustainability, DOT is committed to using all of its authorities to substantially reduce greenhouse gas emissions and transportation-related pollution. So I'm glad at least a couple of you know what the, what the percentage is, or at least you're guessing at that. Um, so uh, Administrator Hutchinson, the uh, administration has really launched a strong effort on the trucking industry to reduce vehicle emissions. Uh, very burdensome, expensive rules on the greenhouse gas portion. Now, I, I get it on, uh, you know, diesel emissions and, and soot and such, and that were made tremendous gains on uh, having the cleanest truck engines we ever had currently. So, uh, but the administration seems to want to push climate goals over the truck driver's needs, the trucking needs, and what consumers need that if you got it, a truck brought it. So, uh, at the same time, you're working on a, a, a speed limiter mandate on heavy vehicles that could actually work against the efforts to reduce emissions. It focuses on <clears throat> how emissions from these vehicles could be lowered by a speed limiter. So uh, what the effect could likely be is that instead of trucks being able to go with the flow of traffic, and we've seen it arbitrarily slowing them down to, in my home state, of 55 miles per hour, thereby creating this accordion effect of cars and trucks um, not being able to go the same speed and slowing down the ability of trucks to deliver and get their job done. And so with uh, the difficulty sometimes with hours of service available to drivers, it's really creating a bottleneck for a lot of folks. So has your agency really assessed um, how these overall emissions would be affected by an actual increase in truck traffic and um, general slowing down of traffic, uh, Ms. Hutchinson. Representative LaMalfa, um, I won't speak to the emissions piece of it is outside of our authorities at the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration, but I can uh, uh, repeat again some of the information I provided to uh, Representative Nels about the speed uh, limiter rulemaking process. We've not yet determined a speed. We have not yet published a notice proposal. So it sounds like you have incomplete information on how what the effects are going to be on traffic, on trucks being able to deliver, hours of service and all that, but you're moving ahead with the mandate. Is that correct? Representative, um, the analysis will be published in the regulatory impact analysis, and we look forward to sharing that with you when it's available. Okay. Thank you. I'm out of time. Yield back. Gentleman yields, Mr. Garcia. 
Thank you, uh, Chairman and Ranking uh, Member, and to all of the witnesses today. Uh, accessible transit is a matter of equity and justice. For years, disenfranchised communities have been left out of the transit planning and have suffered as a result. One such group that historically has been an afterthought in decision making is the community with disabilities. That's why I'm thrilled that the IIJL, uh, JA, help fund the All Stations Accessibility Program, which seeks to modernize rail stations to make them fully ADA accessible. It's about time that we prioritize safe and convenient travel for all users, rather than center it around able-bodied people in predominantly wealthy neighborhoods. The All Stations Accessibility Program awarded $118 million to the Chicago Transit Authority to remodel stations across the city. Many of these stations were built over 50 years ago and will be modernized with elevators, ramps, and improved signage. While the IIJA has distributed historic investments, we also got to make sure that they promote safety for our most vulnerable users, such as pedestrians and bikers as well. Chicago has a network of over 280 miles of bike lanes. Only 40 of them are protected with physical barriers. Archer Avenue in my district, for example, is identified as a spoke route to increase ridership in the city street cycling program. However, the Southwest Side has many barriers to safe walking, biking, and public transportation. These barriers are the result of conditions like heavy industry and truck traffic along with related environmental concerns. We need to make sure that districts like mine get equitable funding to make streets safe for all users. Undersecretary Monge, uh, DOT's National Roadway Safety Strategy includes recommendations for bike uh, lane safety, such as installing divider posts, which can drastically reduce bike crashes with vehicles. However, many roads still do not have physical barriers separating bike lanes. As bike ridership continues to increase, can we incentivize the installation of physical barriers and improve crash reporting to keep bikers safe? Yes, sir. Thank you so much for your leadership. As, as you know, uh, we also were able to get a safe uh, streets and roads for all uh, project uh, uh, for a safe travel for all roadmap uh, for the Chicago Metropolitan Agency. Uh, you're right. In 2022, we had 7,345 pedestrians who were killed in traffic crashes, uh, part of an ongoing epidemic of traffic uh, crashes that, uh, that we are addressing. Uh, the Safe Streets and Roads for All pro program is uh, really a, a wonderful gift that the, that the Congress gave to us because uh, these bike lanes are very easy to, to, to put in place. They don't require a, a, a lot of construction uh, and um, uh, just today announced uh, an, an, another round of them. Uh, so thank you for your support of the program. And thank you. Um, autonomous vehicles, uh, I'll zoom in on one sub-area, uh, Ms. Carlson. In 2018, NHTSA shut down an autonomous school bus project in Florida on a technicality. The equipment had been improperly imported from outside of the U.S. This driverless bus was taking kids back and forth to school with no human operator. I do not believe uh, that it's possible today to ensure the safety of school children on board vehicles absent a human driver. Does NHTSA have the authority to ensure the safety of school kids if an American company were to produce an autonomous school vehicle? And a brief answer, please. Uh, thanks, I appreciate your interest in autonomous vehicles. Uh, this is a, an area where we are, our focus is on the safety of the operation of automated vehicles in a way that can promote innovation. Those two things are not in conflict with each other. I don't believe that we can innovate unless automated vehicles are safe. Uh, I will start with just a basic foundational uh, notion, and that is that if a vehicle is compliant with our FMVSSs, it is up to the states to determine the rules of the road and whether a vehicle can actually operate. But we have extensive safety authority and we use it. We have recalled a number of vehicles under that authority and we continue to monitor it very closely. Thank you. And finally, uh, to someone who hails from Chicago, three decades of wonderful transportation infrastructure experience. Ms. Fernandez, great to see you here. 
do you believe that you have the necessary authority to oversee the safety of autonomous travel, transit vehicles, and what additional clarity can Congress provide in statute to prevent the unsafe operation of such vehicles? Quick answer, Ms. Fernandez. Thank you for your question, uh, Representative uh, Garcia, on this very important issue. I, I just want to uh, restate what my colleagues have shared, and that is that at USDOT, as well as the Federal Transit Administration, safety is front and center. We are always put safety of the passengers um, and operators above anything else, including technology. Uh, we have been investing in uh, research around technology uh, for public transportation, a technology that's centered on the buses at a, at a, at a level, but also about automating uh, maintenance facilities uh, to increase uh, the opportunities for throughput of maintaining those vehicles. Uh, we're still gathering data and information around that space, uh, have not received a full, uh, complete, uh, set of uh, information that would allow us to then uh, make a determination. However, uh, we do know that automation is one of uh, several advancements. However, um, through the, uh, the, the federal government as well as um, our colleagues here, uh, those decisions around safety uh, will be determined by other agencies within the department. Thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Chairman, mm -hmm. I appreciate your indulgence. I yield back. Gentleman yields, Mr. Yakum. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to our witnesses for being here today. Ms. Carlson, on the morning of October 30th, 2018, a driver in Rochester, Indiana, in my district, made a deadly decision to illegally go around a stop school bus whose stop, arm, whose stop arm was up and the lights flashing were activated. She killed three siblings and seriously injured a fourth child. The incident took place on our, in our northern Indiana community and in our state, and it totally shook that community. In the wake of this tragedy, my predecessor, the late Jackie Walorski, authored the Stop for School Buses Act. This legislation, which was included in the Infrastructure and Jobs Act, or IJA, directed NHTSA to evaluate state laws and best practices, mitigation, look at mitigation technologies, and look at driver education materials relating to illegal passing of school buses. As I understand it, NHTSA is still working on these deliverables. Could you please provide an update on where things stand and your projected timeline for completion? Yes, and first, let me just acknowledge the incredible tragedy in your district. Uh, it's, uh, it's really hard to fathom three siblings being a young girl who was killed as she got off a, a school bus. Um, we are committed to school bus safety in a number of different ways. The studies that you referred to are underway. They have been contracted for. Uh, we expect them to be completed, I believe, by uh, sometime in 2024, and we will keep you updated as soon as they are ready. Um, we're doing everything we can to try to, you know, all 50 states have these illegal, uh, you know, uh, laws that prevent people from passing school buses that have their arms up. Uh, people don't always abide by the law, so as, as you correctly point out, one of the things that we're really trying to do is educate young drivers through driver's education materials, uh, and we have a safety campaign on school buses that we funded. Um, and uh, one of the things that is heartening, although it doesn't take away from the tragedy you describe, is that school buses are actually one of the safest forms of transportation for children. Right. Thank you. As, as you know, there are millions of illegal school bus passings uh, every year, and I appreciate your partnership and the hard work to prevent another tragedy like the one that occurred in Rochester. Um, Mr. Bat. You oversee programs with $7.5 billion in funding devoted to building out electric vehicle charging infrastructure. How many chargers have been put in place and in service in that program's two-year existence? Uh, on the federal side, uh, uh, Chairman, uh, Representative, thank you for the question. Um, we uh, just had the first one uh, go online in Ohio, uh, but many more states are coming online in the next weeks and months. Is it acceptable to you that in two years with seven and a half billion dollars that we only have one charger online for that program? No, I think, uh, uh, Representative, I think uh, we obviously would have preferred that to move more quickly. I think from a perspective standpoint, um, $1.2 trillion in the bipartisan infrastructure law, 350 billion of that flowing through federal highways, 7.5 billion on the NEVI program. We had to write the standards um, took us about 35 years to build the interstate system, so two years in, 
Um, I think we're ready to really hit the gas. Um, that's not a good analogy. Move forward quickly on uh, seven and a half billion may not sound like much to our federal government, but to my constituents, that's what we would certainly call real money. How many chargers uh, do you believe will be funded by this program and up and running in service uh, by the end of next year, by the end of 2024? What, what's your agency's projection? Uh, thank you, Chairman. I wasn't meaning to minimize the 7.5 billion. I was just saying in the context of the the full bill, um, uh, the president has set a goal of 500,000 publicly funded. Chargers is about 166,000 in total out there now. Um, we anticipate hitting the president's goal of 500,000. Uh, How many the from, the from the seven and a half billion dollars that was that have been allocated to this specific program? We have one charger up today. How many chargers as a part of this program do you anticipate will be installed by the end of next year from this specific seven and a half billion dollar allocation? Uh, I'll get you. Uh, I'll be happy to follow up afterwards with a, a very specific number, but we anticipate um, all of the states. Uh, coming online in the coming months. Yeah, and I'd very much like to see the, the follow-up with the number of chargers that we project going at the end of next year. Because mm -hmm. with one charger over the course of $7.5 billion in two years, I mean, obviously you can see why there's certainly, I know one of my Democrat colleagues mentioned this as well, I mean, there's certainly bipartisan concern over this program. So to me, when, when I hear from uh, a lot of the industry is that there's a lot of red tape that's, quote, a land, labyrinth of new contracting and performance requirements, all types of things that hold up these projects, that stands in stark contrast with a company like Tesla, who has deployed 17,000 chargers without any government interference or regulation. So, uh, so we'd very much look forward to that follow-up. And Mr. Chairman, thank you for the time. I yield back. The gentleman yields, Mr. Carbajal. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to all of you for your time and your testimonies on the implementation of the bipartisan infrastructure law, that is, that this committee helped draft and which was signed into law over two years ago. In my district, the bipartisan infrastructure law has translated into over $550 million for more than 100 local projects. And more funding continues to come forward. It has been a win-win to help modernize our infrastructure, create good paying jobs, and also begin to tackle the current climate crisis. Under Secretary Monge, I recently attended COP28, where I heard firsthand the positive impacts of American leadership in beginning to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions through implementation of the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, Inflation Reduction Act, and the Chips and Science Act. Currently, there are two new climate-focused highway formula programs. The Bipartisan Infra Infrastructure Law stood up. The Carbon Reduction Program and the PROTECT program. <laughs> Combined, these programs will help reduce our greenhouse gas emissions and harden our infrastructure against extreme weather. Can you provide an update to us on these two programs? Specifically, how are you working with states to make sure we are fully taking advantage of them? Thank you so much, Congressman. Uh, as, as you said, uh, the bipartisan infrastructure law and the uh, Inflation Reduction Act uh, represent the greatest opportunity uh, to address uh, the fact that our transportation network is the largest source of climate emissions in our country, and, and in doing so, uh, create thousands of American jobs uh, and, um, and ensure America's leadership around the globe. Uh, we do have $2.8 billion for the PROTECT program and another uh, uh, $3.7 billion uh, for the Carbon Reduction Program. And if it's okay with you, I'd like to defer to uh, Administrator Bott to, to give an uh, update on his programs. Great. Uh, thank you, Representative. Uh, I, would, uh, I would just say that uh, of the $27.5 billion that are climate-related uh, funding within the bipartisan infrastructure law, specifically around PROTECT, there are formula dollars that we're working with the states to get them to obligate those fundings. And we're also, uh, we put out a NOFO uh, notice of funding opportunity for discretionary protect dollars that is both for uh, the formula side is for the states and this is for communities to deal with uh, climate related issues for their infrastructure. Thank you. Administrator Bat. the Office of Management and Budget issued its final guidance implementing the Build America, Buy America Act in August. The guidance allows agencies to provide additional agency uh, specific guidance where necessary. What if any FHWA guidance might be issued to address the FHWA specific issues. 
thank you, Representative. Uh, Buy America is very important to our president, uh, and uh, this is something that we are working very closely uh, to, um, uh, to pursue. FHWA has been working on a rulemaking that will propose to withdraw the standing waiver um, that is out there now for manufactured products and proposed standards for applying Buy America requirements for manufactured products. We'll continue to work with waivers uh, for states when they come in. So we're, we're trying to balance getting these projects built quickly uh, with the idea that we want these uh, jobs to be for American workers. Thank you. A sense of realism is extremely Im important. Administrator Bott, the bipartisan infrastructure law required the Federal Highway Administration to establish an advisory board to inform the development of the new national pilot program to test mileage-based user fees as a replacement to the current gas tax. Where are we with that process? When will that body be constituted? Yeah, I, I think, uh, thank you, uh, Representative. Very important uh, that we get that feedback in to inform our next uh, reauthorization. Uh, I think uh, the, uh, we call, uh, had the call for the, the names go out. We've received those. Working through that, and would expect uh, uh, to get that, see that come up uh, in the next year. Any sense? General next year, beginning? Uh, I'll be happy to follow up uh, okay. with your office uh, with a more specific time. Thank you very much. Mr. Chair, I yield back. Gentleman yields. Mr. Molinaro. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you all for uh, uh, being here today. Uh, my colleague uh, 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 walked us down uh, uh, at least the line of questioning I was going to ask, so I appreciated the updated uh, uh, information regarding the guidance. Um, I do want to acknowledge, of course, uh, having spent the last 12 years uh, serving in local government, uh, the historic uh, significance of uh, the IJA investment. Of course, in states like New York, we continue to see uh, a delay in getting dollars on the ground ultimately uh, for the kind of work that uh, we'd like to see advance in the state of New York. Uh, I do um, uh, want to return to the question of, uh, uh, of AI, which I think came up a little bit earlier, uh, and uh, Administrator Bott, if I could, um, obviously we acknowledge uh, AI's uh, potential within uh, infrastructure development. Uh, as noted uh, earlier this year, President Biden announced uh, through executive order and AI directing federal agencies to monitor and explore a responsible use of AI as it's uh, obviously increasingly uh, deployed in a variety of industries. Uh, can you speak to uh, the, uh, the FHWA's uh, uh, response uh, to the executive order and uh, discuss, if you would, uh, the administration's plan to uh, foster the use of AI uh, in project development and planning? Uh, thank you, Representative. And I, I will also uh, ask uh, the Undersecretary as well to for the more broad administration approach. Uh, you know, I've spent a lot of my career at the intersection of technology and transportation. Uh, AI is something we want to be very careful with as we uh, develop solutions, particularly around the transportation side, uh, traffic operations. Uh, AI is being deployed um, right now uh, by private sector companies and by states to better operate, uh, you know, traffic management uh, systems. On the construction side, we're looking at things like parametric design uh, to um, use technology to help us design some of our uh, projects. So we're just in the nascent stages, uh, but that's certainly something I'm not sure if uh, the understanding. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, just this week, the president uh, convened the AI Council, of which uh, Secretary Buttigieg is, uh, is a member. There are many use cases in transportation, as you know, including uh, in automated vehicles, advanced air mobility, uh, in asset management, traffic demand management, uh, at the department, we are a regulator, we are a user, we are a funder of research, uh, including at the Turner Fairbank Highway Center, the William Hughes Technical Center, and UTCs across the country. Uh, as uh, Administrator Bot, Bot said, he used to run ITS America, so he's got a, a, a lot to know about this. Uh, AI has to be safe and secure, it has to be responsible, it has to support American workers, uh, and uh, ensure that we are protecting privacy as well as uh, managing the risk for cybersecurity. Uh, advancement and incentivizing its uh, use uh, in the planning uh, and development of, of infrastructure con and construction projects, critically important, in fact, to driving down cost and enhancing efficiency at the local level. To uh, Administrator Hutchinson, I, if you would, um, I also wanted to ask about AI in the, in the trucking space. Uh, and how ultimately uh, you're collaborating with stakeholders uh, in, in, the, in this space uh, to ensure the future of the industry and obviously uh, recognize the, the commitment to safety. Thank you, Representative, uh, for your 
a highlight on AI. Um, we're hearing from our stakeholders a growing interest in how AI is going to affect uh, jobs in the trucking industry. Um, I won't claim to be an expert in AI, and I intend to rely on the experts in AI to help guide us through the work we do together with truckers, um, all commercial motor vehicle operators in, in AI. Um, so I look forward to working with you in your office on this further. I think it's uh, for us, or certainly from my perspective, critically important. We balance uh, the use of the technology with safety, but also ensuring, obviously, the protection uh, of those jobs. So not only working with the AI experts, but working with the trucking experts and the, and the folks, men and women, who are, are actually uh, driving uh, uh, on our highways. Um, I, um, I have no uh, further questions, but I do want to say, ultimately, uh, I want to offer, uh, in particular, to the FTA and, and Ms. Fernandez, just uh, in observation, uh, having spent much of my uh, adult life in local elected service, um, uh, public transportation, critically important. Access uh, to public transportation from those uh, living with intellectual, physical, and developmental disabilities, even more important. And while we as a society have made significant advancements to address through ADA compliance, physical disabilities, we've made very slow progress when it comes to providing uh, access, not only physical access to America's public transit system, buses, trains, et cetera, uh, uh, not only access, physical access, um, but connection to uh, employment opportunities, ensuring that local regional administrators are focused on making sure those with intellectual and developmental disabilities have access. This is a population that experiences 80% unemployment, and we have a great opportunity if only the administration would put as much emphasis on intellectual and developmental disabilities as we have physical. Not a criticism, just uh, to uh, further incentivize. And with that, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman yields, Mr. Auchincloss. Thank you, Chair. Uh, this week, the Washington Bridge on Interstate 195 in Providence has been closed due to a critical failure of some bridge components. Uh, Administrator Batter, are you aware of this closure? Uh, yes, uh, Representative. Uh, Secretary Buttigieg spoke with the governor yesterday. We've worked with uh, RIDOT. We have a division administrator there and uh, very aware of the, uh, of the project itself. As you know, this closure has been hugely inconvenient to tens of thousands of my constituents and also to Rhode Island residents as well. Uh, time away from family, missed work, uh, and long hours in congestion. You noted in your testimony the role that um, the Highway Administration has played in supporting Los Angeles and Philadelphia and repairing sections of their interstates. What can Rhode Island expect in collaboration with you to address this issue as expeditiously as possible? Uh, thank you, Representative. Uh, our division administrator and our staff are currently uh, assessing what the options are. Uh, this is a more of a, a failure of a 1960s bridge, um, so it's not an emergency in the same way as a tanker fire or a fire that has taken it down, but there is federal, large federal eligibility uh, to use funds uh, to help repair the bridge. There's large federal eligibility for the funds to repair? Through, through, through the bridge program that is provided for federal funds. So we're working to figure out exactly how we can uh, best support them. That's promising, and we can certainly want the, the funding to support it. What about technical support to reduce the timeline to get it up and running? Yeah, uh, thank you, Representative. Um, it is my understanding that they're going to use uh, uh, one of the spans to, to take half the traffic in a couple of weeks uh, in each direction. It's about 96,000 vehicles a day on that road, and then uh, looking at uh, a few months. Uh, but we are actively engaged uh, with the uh, state, as well as the private sector contractors who are already mobilized. So we're going to get that bridge uh, open and repaired as quickly as possible. Do you think there are things that the state could be doing to reduce the timeline for repair? I mean, we're looking at, in Pennsylvania, Governor Shapiro got it up and open in, what, a week? Uh, two weeks for Pennsylvania, eight days for California. I think every... Those are the kind of timelines we're looking for, I think. Yeah. I, thank you, Representative. I understand that for, for, for Rhode Islanders and, and everyone uh, on the East Coast, it's a critical artery. Uh, we will do everything we can to get that bridge open as quickly as possible. Okay, so I've got your commitment for continued collaboration and technical and financial support on that. Absolutely. Great, thank you. Uh, uh, Ms. Carlson, uh, earlier this week, I sent a letter to the department regarding Massachusetts' right to repair law. This is overwhelmingly supported by my constituents and by Bay Staters at large. In August, uh, NHTSA sent a letter to Massachusetts that clarified that its right to repair law does not conflict with the Safety Act. That was a welcome revision of an earlier uh, position. 
But the letter still described a compliance system that preferences vehicle manufacturers over independent repair shops, particularly with regard to how independent repair shops access vehicle data. This is really still disjunctive with the spirit of the right to repair law, which is that we want a level playing field for independent mechanics as well as the automakers uh, to be able to repair these vehicles and really empower consumers to shop around for the best service and the best price. Uh, can you describe the differences between remote data access for vehicle manufacturers and independent repair shops and the safety concerns that NHTSA is purporting exist with remote access? I can, and thank you for your letter. And also, I do want to stress that we support right to repair. The secretary supports right to repair. It's extremely important that consumers yes, but your letter, but it, have your, choice. You, were, you support the proposition of right to repair, but unfortunately, still putting in technical impediments to its realization. So the, the right to repair, as I said, is extremely important. It's also extremely important that it be implemented in a way that reduces or minimizes cybersecurity risks. And the letter that we sent to Massachusetts in August, uh, in very close collaboration with the Massachusetts Attorney General's Office and our Department of Justice and our White House, sets forth a way in which the statute can be implemented that minimizes those risks. Um, automobile dealer networks have a separate kind of closed system with respect to uh, the transmission of data between manufacturers and those dealers. We work very carefully with them as well to try to minimize security risks, but it does pose a somewhat different problem. The, the thing that we're really concerned about is open access, where a terrorist, for example, could take over a fleet of vehicles. We've actually seen this happen with a white hat hacker and I, I understand essentially the concerns. weaponize those vehicles. I understand the concerns, but you see my concern here. We have the Biden administration, which is laudably looking to uh, break up cartel-like behavior and go after junk fees for consumers, but then we have administrative actions that are preferencing closed systems, that are preferencing the big OEMs over the independent repair shops, which are in turn really raising prices and lowering choice for consumers. So there's a, there's a tension here. Concerned about cybersecurity, I worked in the industry for a couple of years, I get it. I'm not, I am not yet convinced that this remote data access has a big disparity for cybersecurity between these two options. I think had NHTSA worked ahead of time with the Attorney General and with uh, interested stakeholders as opposed to going to, to court, this could have been resolved e more easily, and I would encourage you to continue to work to ensure that the true spirit of right to repair is realized in Massachusetts. We will continue to work with the state of Massachusetts. We did get in touch You're with You're going to have to make this a quick response. Yeah, I apologize. I'm, I'm well, out of time. Well before the court case. Sorry. I'll stop there. Jim, as time's expired. Mr. Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Administrator Bott, uh, thank you for your comments. Um, regarding the uh, ID1 uh, build that's happening in my, um, it's happening in my district in Syracuse, New York. Um, and in particular, in your comments, uh, you said that the purpose of this project and, and many others uh, is to reconnect communities. Uh, you may know that the 15th Ward in Syracuse was particularly harmed uh, and the minority community there um, historically black community there was actually uh, cut in half and really never recovered um, you know, from, uh, from the original construction of I-81. And of course, this project goes a long way towards uh, restoring that community in particular. Um, I wouldn't expect you to know exactly the details I'll describe, but I'm looking for your advice and counsel. Um, where this runs right next to Martin Luther King Elementary School, uh, the highway is going to shift slightly uh, to the east, creating a green zone and a green space that has never existed before. Now, my hope is that because it exists on currently on federal property, that uh, there will be a lot of transparency and um, inclusion in the communities and the discussion uh, of how that uh, created space, so to speak, gets used. Uh, it's, I guess, my suspicion that there are a lot of backroom deals that happen uh, that don't include uh, necessarily all the stakeholders. In this case, uh, this neighborhood adjoining and surrounding the Martin Luther King Elementary School. Um, can you give me any insight or advice, um, the federal government's Department of Transportation's role in adjudicating how this green space, this new space, so to speak, gets used, and uh, how we can be a, um, 
a participant, my office, your office, can be a participant in providing the transparency for, uh, for what happens to that community. Uh, thank you, Representative. And uh, I've actually been to Syracuse, and I uh, understand the impact uh, that this uh, roadway construction had on the neighborhood. Um, I will follow up with you afterwards on the specifics. I, I would say right now, one of the projects that uh, Secretary Buttigieg announced was uh, I-375 conversion in uh, Detroit, Michigan from a highway uh, to a boulevard that's going to free up a lot of public land. I know that in Michigan, they've stood up a local and state group to allow for community involvement. Um, and so I will follow up with you to see if it's the uh, same process that would apply here. But we always want to ensure transparency in any of these transactions. Is there, is the federal here. government, sure. yes, sir. Uh, which is, um, Syracuse did get a $500,000 uh, planning grant uh, to, to address this issue. As you said, 1958, uh, dis uh, that project displaced 1,300 families. And as we consider how to redress that, it is important to have the voice of the community in there. We'd love to continue working with your office to make sure that that planning grant goes well and that the community's voice is heard. Thank you. I've uh, sat down with the engineers and um, um, the public housing authorities that are uh, adjacent to that area, and it's their number one, you know, concern. Um, and uh, this this goes way beyond politics. It's just simply good governance and the right thing to do. Um, so uh, I just want to make sure that the federal authorities have uh, are providing the oversight uh, and using, frankly, our office collectively, yours, mine. Um, you know, to provide that kind of transparency um, in this particular case. So um, I look forward to that advice and particularly the Detroit uh, example. Um, Under Secretary uh, Monet, uh, and Monet, sorry, um, the, uh, one of the concerns that we have in New York State uh, is something called the scaffold law. Uh, there's 49 other states that have no similar law, but in New York State, we have a law that has uh, absolute liability um, that, uh, that comes from gravity-related uh, incident, uh, incidences. Uh, for example, on, on the Tappan Zee Bridge, this particular law added $300 million of uh, expense uh, to the construction of that bridge, and that's true for every infrastructure project in New York. Um, do you have any advice on how we can uh, perhaps address this uh, so that New York State can, can be more efficient with how it uses federal dollars? Thank you, sir. I'm not familiar with that law. Uh, worker safety is a critically important uh, aspect of our work uh, and um, uh, would love to uh, continue to work with your team to, to, to address that. I, I think just following the examples of 49 other states would be, uh, would be helpful. Yes, sir. So, thank you. Ms. Representative Fushi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to the witnesses for your testimonies. The Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act is a historic piece of legislation that is rebuilding the infrastructure we use every day to get where we need to go. I am especially grateful for the recently announced $1 billion grant the Department of Transportation um, has given to develop a new inner city passenger rail route between Raleigh, North Carolina and Richmond, Virginia. And I was proud to join Secretary Buttigieg in North Carolina earlier this week for the announcement of this historic grant. These investments made possible by the Biden administration will develop this inner city passenger rail route that will ease the burden on our highways and boost economic development in North Carolina's fourth district. Administrator Bott, this summer, the Federal Highway Administration issued a call for applications for two key programs, the Reconnecting Communities Pilot under IIJA and the Neighborhood Access and Equity Program um, under the Inflation Reduction Act. Each program has, focus, has a focus on redressing the harms of the past, such as removing highways that divide or cut off communities. But these programs are also about building the future in communities that have been left behind. I'm hopeful we'll see investments in projects like providing better transit service for low-income communities. Can you give us an update on when these awards will go out under these programs 
And can you speak to how the department will balance the funding between removing harmful or outdated infrastructure with building new infrastructure to improve access and safety? Uh, thank you, Representative. Um, uh, one of the projects I'm most proud of in my career was the I-70 uh, project in Denver that reconnected a community, put a four-acre park, uh, and is now a, a model for many projects uh, that are trying to reconnect um, communities that were torn apart by highway construction. Um, we work very closely with the Office of the Secretary uh, on the reconnecting program, so I want to let uh, uh, the Undersecretary address the issue. Thank you very much, ma'am. And I, I lived uh, for 18 months in North Carolina and uh, traveled 30,000 miles on, on the highways uh, uh, from Murphy to Manio. Uh, as you mentioned, the uh, Inflation Reduction Act and the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law gave us uh, $1.893 billion uh, for grants, uh, and uh, uh, and uh, we're hoping to get those that money out early next year. Uh, and there really is a large backlog of projects. Uh, and the the wonderful thing about the, these two projects is it gives us um, many tools uh, in order to stitch back communities that were torn apart, not just by uh, big highways, but also by rail lines, by by port and airport infrastructure. Uh, it's not always about bringing down a highway. Sometimes it's capping. Sometimes it's reconfiguring. Uh, different uh, uh, different interchanges, uh, but uh, there, uh, there is an enormous backlog of these of these projects. Same story all around the, the country, and look forward to working with your office. Um, also, can you tell us what you're doing to further advance equity uh, through the IIJA funding? Yes, ma'am. Equity means a lot of things for us, you know, and uh, it, it's a, a question of. Um, making sure that people have access to the decision-making process. It's making sure that uh, as we put these, uh, these projects in the ground, that those jobs, which are, don't require a college degree in many cases, uh, and are a pathway to the middle class, that more people have access to those jobs. It means making sure that uh, uh, people with uh, disabilities uh, have access as well. And it also making sure that, the, that we are being cognizant of, of the impacts of uh, both the benefits and the costs of the projects. Uh, and building and, and building better than we knew how to do in the 1960s. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll yield back the balance of my time. Gentlelady yields back. We'll now recognize uh, Representative Chavez de Reamer. Thank you, Chairman. <clears throat> Good afternoon. And thank you to all the witnesses for being here today. Of course, we're here to discuss the oversight of the IIJ's $1.2 trillion that was authorized and appropriated over a five-year plan. So it would seem counterintuitive that certain states would continue to toll roads for infrastructure revenue. As a reminder to all, that is exactly what the Oregon Department of Transportation proposes to do to specific areas of I-205 and I-5 near Portland and in my district. Tolling in Oregon has united opposition from state legislators, local mayors, county commissioners, citizens from all political back backgrounds, and me. Administrator Bott, I appreciated getting the chance to speak with you over the phone back in October on these issues in which you explained that ODOT was reducing the scope of the proposed project, but that ODOT and the Federal Highway Administration both agree that more extensive NEPA environmental impact statement was not necessary. Do you still stand by that assessment? Yes or no? Uh, thank you, Representative, and thank you for the previous conversation. Um, we always follow the law. And what we're doing yes is Yes or no? Do you stand by that? Uh, yes, we follow the law. Then how is it the public supposed to feel as though they are being heard and supported in this process if there is no new or revised EIS for public scrutiny or discussion? So we are following NEPA and the steps of NEPA, and we are ensuring that there is public dialogue. Administrator Bott, the public is still unaware of what the proposal plans to do about the congestion and the new lanes. It is my understanding that ODOT has responded to many cities in my district with dubious assumptions, weak and unrealistic analysis, or even with pertinent information for various locations and intersections omitted for responses as to how tolling is going to impact those communities. ODOT itself last summer even admitted that they missed the mark on this public admission. Again, Mr. Bott, Secretary Buttigieg sat before this committee in September and stated that if a project sponsor fails to do the appropriate outreach, then it can lead to a NEPA failure or a Title VI concern. And if those scenarios that could lead to that project 
for not getting cleared by the department. So by that assessment, it makes sense to me. Would the Federal Highway Administration determine that a revised scope of the tolling project without additional environmental assessments and new public comment period, um, that really con constitutes a NEPA failure, correct? Uh, uh, Representative, I understand your concerns about the three projects that involve tolling in Oregon, and we will continue to follow NEPA. We will ensure that the public receives the necessary information. And but that hasn't been done to this point. There's a pause in Oregon by the governor's office for two years, and there's been no answer down the road. No new testimony has been taken by the public. To me, that's a NEPA failure, correct? Uh, Representative, I'm aware that the governor has paused uh, tolling, and we will continue to work with states and communities uh, that are part of these projects. But ODOT has still yet to propose a mitigation plan or strategy. Therefore, this entire proposal from ODOT seems like it keeps moving the goalposts. That's a problem for somebody like myself who represents the entire constituency who decided that they don't want tolling any longer. The public like myself were getting frustrated, as you can probably hear it in my voice. Uh, these sorts of plans for tolling are supposed to be presented so motorists mayors, counties, and small businesses can make meaningful comments. So let's not burden our commuters or create havoc for small businesses and communities who still struggle with the impact of tolling. So again, Administrator Bott, based on what we've discussed thus far, here today and in prior months, do you believe this process is seriously flawed and can you commit to me and to my constituents to a redress of grievances um, from the communities in the 5th District to either assist ODOT in refining the review process for tolling implementation, create new transparent lines of communication with the public, or better yet, please work to rescind this unpopular proposal altogether. Representative, I hear you. I, I heard you in our previous conversation. I commit to working with your office, ODOT, uh, and all the communities who are impacted to ensure that uh, we follow NEPA to the letter of the law and make sure that the public engagement process uh, follows. So I still see we're, we're no better than we were when I talked to you the first time. So uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back the rest of my time. The gentlelady yields back. We will now recognize Representative Titus. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and thank all of you for being here. You know, in Nevada, we're really thankful for the amount of money that we got, Mr. Bott, from uh, uh, the infrastructure bill, I think it's $543.8 million to improve our highways and our bridges, and included in this is $11.4 million for the carbon reduction program. Uh, I'd like to ask you about that, because my understanding is that since last February, the Nevada Department of Transportation and Nevada Department uh, Division of Environmental Protection has been working to get some feedback on whether, and some guidance on whether the funding that we received that 11.4 million can be used for a new program that was created by the legislature. Now this program the legislature created is called Clean Trucks and Buses Incentive Program. And we're trying to find out if the funding that's under the carbon reduction program can be used to help uh, get that program started, get it up and running, be used to help finance that uh, incentive program and we haven't been able to get an answer and it's caused confusion and it's caused delays and it was just uh, yesterday that we got some response and that wasn't very satisfactory. So I just need to hear you kind of address that and commit to working with us and see if we can figure out if that funding can indeed be used for that new program created by the legislature. Thank you Representative Titus and I uh, guess um, I actually have worked very closely with uh, Director uh, uh, Larkin, Thompson, uh, and uh, the approach that Nevada is taking is a, a new um, approach. We're excited for the innovation. Uh, we just always want to make sure that we're following the law, and so happy to engage uh, with uh, Nevada uh, to ensure that we move this forward. Well, great. I, you know, that I'm not sure if it's exactly right. You know, the legislature kind of goes off on its own sometimes, but we need to have an answer to that and see if we can fix it because I do think it's a good program and I think it, the the intention of it or the goals of it fit right in with this funding that y'all have. So I'd appreciate it if you would work with us to see if it is eligible, see what we can do to get it going and, and, uh, and fix that. Uh, yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. I'm glad to, to have that on record. Um, Secretary Monge, 
I, about a month ago, I had the opportunity to join FTC, I mean RTC in Clark County, and it serves all of Southern Nevada, and they welcomed their first battery electric bus to the fleet. It was very exciting, a fun day. We rode the bus, and that was also made possible by the bipartisan infrastructure law. But we found that one of the challenges for transferring to these kind of buses is that they have higher upfront and fueling costs. So as you've now had the opportunity to work with some of the transit agencies around the country who are transitioning to this kind of fleet, do you have any need for additional support or additional changes, anything we can do to make that process better or more efficient, quicker? Yes, ma'am, and I want to thank you for being generous with your time when I visited Las Vegas and nice. uh, visited the transit center that's also funded by Bipartisan Infrastructure Law. Uh, we've been working very closely with uh, bus manufacturers, uh, and if it's okay with you, I invite uh, Administrator Fernandez uh, to, to, to weigh in here, if that's okay with you. That'd be great. Thank you. Again. <laughs> Thank you very much, Representative Titus, uh, and uh, for raising the actions that RTC is taking. Uh, they have been working uh, with the Federal Transit Administration and our regional office to look at uh, transitioning their uh, buses. And the, what, one of the great things about the bipartisan infrastructure law is that it provided additional funding for low and no emission. Uh, we have um, a thousand electric buses that are operating in roads throughout the country. And with the funding that's available, we'll be able to uh, provide additional opportunities for transit agencies to apply for our discretionary program. 2,900 more buses uh, will be on, um, on the streets of America. It, it's creating the manufacturing uh, jobs that are necessary for us to continue to grow a healthy uh, industry and uh, with the state of Nevada and in particular the RTC now looking at that transition we have been working very closely with them on uh, the funding that they currently have in addition to emphasizing that uh, in the uh, no emission there is a 5% available for training existing operators to give them the skills necessary so that they can work on the new uh, technology. Well, great. Uh, you know, Ms. Maynard, who heads up the RTC, is, has great leadership, a lot of vision. That's an agency that I enjoy working with. And, and they've been very good at uh, incorporating equity uh, and serving all parts of Southern Nevada, and that's been a priority of theirs. And I know it's a priority of the administration, and I very much appreciate that. But let me know if there's any way we can be helpful to push this along with their transition. Yeah, thank you for that offer, and I guess uh, I'll be happy to work with you in your office. Thank you. I yield back. All right. Gentlelady yields back, and we'll now go to Representative Stauber for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Mr. Batt, uh, you commented that uh, $7.5 billion in the IIJA was uh, put forth towards charging stations, and you uh, stated since the legislation became law over two years ago, there's been one charging station constructed in Ohio. Is that correct? Uh, one has come online, yes. Okay. Um, can you reassure this committee that that charging station was constructed following the Build America, Buy America, Critical Minerals reference charging stations, reference the uh, uh, building a charging stations? Um, I b believe it would have been, yes. But I can confirm that. Do you know if there's a, uh, in the IIJA, if the Build America, Buy American provision even exists involving critical minerals in uh, building out charging stations? Uh, uh, thank you, Representative. I, the on the, the answer is no. Oh, was it critical minerals? Are critical minerals, the answer is no. There is no provision in the IIJA to build charging stations using domestically sourced critical minerals mined in the United States. Ms. Fernandez, a subcomponent in the IIJA, a subcomponent becomes a component once a manufacturing process takes place. Is that correct? Yes, sir, that's correct. I represent the iron range that mines the taconite that makes 
approximately 80% of domestic steel. Under the IIJA, you could have a 25-foot piece of steel shipped in from China and another 25-foot uh, piece of steel, Chinese-made. You could put them together, and the weld that uh, it takes place in the United States is legal under the IAJA, saying it's domestically sourced. Is that right? Is it, do you agree? Do you agree that Chinese steel, pieces of steel that are shipped, non-union labor, no project labor agreements, do you agree that they should be brought together here in the United States and then a U.S. worker puts a weld on it and that now becomes domestically sourced under the IIJA? Is that fair to my constituents? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Representative Stauber, for your question. Uh, it's a very important one. Um, the Federal Transit Administration follows the law and by America I, I, requires I, that transit operators that are procuring... Uh, no, I, this, is the, this is the question I asked. Do you agree that Chinese imported steel comes to the United States and, and because it's welded in the United States, do you believe that should be... Uh, considered manufactured, domestically manufactured? The answer is no, it should not be, because I want the steel domestically sourced by the miners that I represent, ma'am. Congressman, if I, if I could jump in here, uh, which is uh, Congress sent a very clear message to the administration and one that President Biden supports that the future is gonna be built in America we are implementing by America. This is, but, but, but Mr. Federal Monet, this, this part of the IAJ allows that to happen. And we are getting complaints in our office, and, and, and the, the, uh, Ms. Fernandez, your regional offices aren't responding to them. That's why the, I bring the up the Federal question. The Federal Transit Administration has the, the strongest standards for uh, Buy America and the most expertise to the point where other agencies are coming to Mr. us. Mr. For, Monet, uh, just with my time left, um, you are a supporter of electric vehicles, right? Yes, sir. Where would you like those critical minerals to be uh, sourced? Uh, using American labor, American technology, or foreign adversarial nations uh, like Indonesia and the 15 of the 19 industrial mines in China uh, that uh, use child slave labor? Do you want them mined in the United States or foreign adversarial countries? That's just the question I asked. I don't need, to, I don't need you to belabor the point. Do you want them mined domestically in the United States or using foreign slave labor? Yes or no? Which one do you want? Uh, Congress and the president supports... Uh, no, you're not answering my question. That's yes, an easy yeah, question. America. Wouldn't you want it sourced <laughs> in the United choices. States using American technology in American labor? Come on. To be eligible for the Come on. credits, uh, you have to have... Come on, that's labor. an easy question. Don't you want American workers to produce the, the critical minerals yes. that we use in our everyday lives? That's not a trick question, Mr. Monet. I think you're better than that, and I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. We'll now recognize Representative Sykes for five minutes. Thank you uh, to the chair and ranking member for this subcommittee hearing. i uh, really looking forward to having the conversation uh, about the implementation of the bipartisan infrastructure law. It, is, it has been a fantastic uh, part of the inclusion of the 13th Congressional District of Ohio and in the entire state. Uh, in just the last month, we were uh, in Akron, in, in my district, for the groundbreaking of a local transit authority, Metro, for a new maintenance and operations facility, which was made possible only because of the bipartisan infrastructure law. That was a $37 million investment into uh, transit, and we had a similar uh, investment in the district with $4 million going to Sardar for the zero emission buses, which is, again is very exciting. Uh, Administrator Fernandez, I would like to direct my attention to you if I could uh, and let you know how much we're appreciating the work that your agency is doing and what it means to move people back and forth to work, to school, to be a part of the community. And we know these vehicles like electric cars and buses are the future, but we also know that they're going to require a different kind of infrastructure, both physical, like charging stations and human capital through the workforce. So if you could talk to us a little bit uh, about how FTA is ensuring we have aspects of the supply chain supporting this infrastructure and a workforce. Yes, thank you very much for your question, uh, Representative, and, and thank you for um, 
uh, the invitation and joining us at that uh, event uh, together with uh, Senator Brown. As we, uh, as we see the bipartisan infrastructure law and the record level of investment that it brought to public transportation, one of the critical areas uh, was on workforce. Wanting to make sure that the workforce was available and trained to not only provide the services, but also to maintain uh, that investment. Uh, the Federal Transit Administration uh, implemented a transit workforce center to work with transit agencies uh, to begin that very training uh, that is so critical uh, as we're looking at new technologies and in this instance, uh, zero emission buses. Uh, we also, um, with the investment uh, and the creation of a rail vehicle uh, program, a rail vehicle replacement program, and the opportunities there as well to, to now look at the 22,000 rail vehicles across the nation and 10% or more of that um, over the 25 years of uh, useful life, that this, we see this as an opportunity that is um, a whole of transit, uh, focusing on workforce development, focusing on recruiting, retraining, and retaining uh, employees in this industry to make it stronger. Thank you so much, Administrator. And I, I want to talk a little bit more about the EV infrastructure um, and tout some great work that we have going on in Ohio. Uh, we just last Friday brought the first EV charger that was funded by the National Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Program online. Uh, but for those of us in Northeast Ohio, particularly where I uh, currently live and drive an electric vehicle, we still have a lot of ways to go with our public infrastructure to make it uh, more accessible to people. Uh, and it, it means that we certainly need to be working closer with you and let me uh, go ahead and extend myself as a partner to allow that to happen. Uh, so I have two questions to whoever wants to uh, answer this one here. Uh, well, specifically, Administrator Back, can you talk about what the Federal Highway Administration is doing to help localities navigating the permitting process and just the infrastructure, um, building up that infrastructure in a timely manner so people can be ready for it. So it can be ready for when people are ready to purchase those vehicles. And uh, Mr. Undersecretary, I heard you going on about the tax credits. Uh, we yesterday had a, a town hall, uh, a telephone town hall with my district about uh, how the uh, Inflation Reduction Act has been lowering costs, and I know that you were about to start talking about the tax credits. So, uh, Mr. Bott and then uh, Mr. Undersecretary, if you could please answer those questions. Uh, thank you, Representative Sykes. Uh, I would just say that uh, of the 7.5 billion, 5 billion is for the NEVI program. Two and a half billion will be for community-funded uh, chargers. So we want uh, there to be a, a broad network. Um, happy to work with you and, and any localities with our division offices. And, and just on the on the charger piece, um, I know folks have said, well, has this, is this taking so long? Two years ago when the program was set up, there were zero manufacturers uh, of uh, chargers in this country. Today there's 43. Uh, it's about $500 million in private investment. And so all of the chargers that are going to go in are going to be built in America, and that's what the president's vision is about. And uh, quickly, just, uh, you know, uh, the cost of electric vehicles has dropped 22 percent. That's 15,000 just in the last year. And thanks to the uh, tax credits that are in the IRA, which are going to be um, now available at the point of sale, you can walk into a Chevy dealer and walk out with a 2023 Chevy Bolt for less than $20,000. Uh, there's money uh, in, our, in our legislation, $7 billion to promote uh, domestic sourcing of minerals. Uh, there are a lot of incentives to make sure that the future of the automotive industry is going to be built in America. Thank you, Mr. Terry. You'll back. The gentlelady yields back. We'll now recognize Representative Massey for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Ms. Carlson, first of all, I want to thank you for what your department does. It's hard to find something government does where 90% of people agree or appreciate. And I think the five star crash rating that NHTSA performs. There's nothing political about it. When steel and aluminum meets a concrete barrier at 35 miles an hour, all the fiction and politics go out the window. And I think it's, it's a good model where you provide consumers with information they need to make a good decision. And then you leave it up to the free market. There, you know, the free market's involved there. You might want a, a four-star crash rating or a five-star crash rating. So I appreciate you um, doing that program and administering it. I want to focus on, on one program that Congress has proposed 
um, that I have questions about, and you may too. Section 24220 of the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act requires NHTSA, your department, to issue a regulation that by 2026, all newly manufactured passenger vehicles can, and now I'll read from the, the statute, passively monitor the performance of a driver of a motor vehicle to accurately identify whether that driver may be impaired and prevent or limit motor vehicle operation if an impairment is detected. Now we're two years past the passage of this law and we're three years away from the, the deadline, not, not just for the rule, but for the auto manufacturers to comply. Uh, how will this technology work and does it exist presently? First, thank you so much for the shout out about NCAP, which I agree with you about. And we have actually issued various up proposed updates to NCAP to continue that uh, opportunity for consumer choice and to incentivize the private sector to improve safety. So thank you. Um, you may have seen that yesterday we released an, uh, an ANPRM, an advanced notice of proposed rulemaking about the very question that you're asking about the particular bill provision that asks a series of questions and spells out what we know about the state of technology that could at some point meet the provisions of the Bipartisan Inf Infrastructure Law along with the Vehicle Safety Act, which imposes additional requirements on us. Um, we spelled out some possible technologies in that ANPRM. Those include, for example, driver monitoring that's currently used typically for advanced driver assist systems, but could do things like track whether somebody is actually looking at the road, whether their pupils are dilated, et cetera. Uh, we also um, spelled out technology that um, has received funding from the federal government called DADS technology. That is actually active technology at this point. It's not passive as the bill requires. Um, we, so we think there are promising technologies on the market, but I think it's safe to say that we do not think they are available yet in a way that actually will achieve the goals both of the bipartisan infrastructure law and the Vehicle Safety Act. And our ANPRM actually asks a bunch of questions about how we might get there, if we do get there, what problems might arise as a result. We don't, for example, want to have false positives where somebody is detected to have blood in their alcohol, alcohol in their blood, sorry, and in fact does not and can't start their vehicle. If we had a 99.9% .9 effective system, we estimate there's something like a billion trips a day that, that would leave a million people not able to start their vehicle. So we got to get this technology well, The right. technology talks about disabling a vehicle, possibly in transit. That's very concerning to me if you have a false positive for that. Yeah, and we, me, do, we do ask questions about that in the ANPRM as well. Let, let me just say I had a, a mentor who told me that hope is not a business plan. And uh, I think that applies here. You know, before seat belts were mandated, they were an option in cars. Before airbags were mandated, they were an option in cars. And before backup cameras were mandated, they were an option in cars. I think uh, this is one area where Congress is way ahead of its, in front of its skis. And they've mandated a technology that, I mean, you're being nice about it, but let's just admit to it, it does not exist. If it did, somebody would be offering it in a car. Uh, so, there, you know, my constituents have a lot of concerns about this. It's no secret I tried to defund the mandate recently uh, in, the, in a funding bill, and that's because it's just not feasible. As you mentioned, the false positives would far outweigh the advantages. You, you have a mother who swerves to miss wildlife and then goes around a pothole, then pulls over for an ambulance, and the dashboard is the, is the juror and the executioner and says, get over to the side of the road with your kids and wait there. Now, how do you appeal such a conviction when your car, like have you guys thought about that at all, yeah, how we, you would? We do want to get it right, but it is the case that about a third of motor vehicle fatalities involve impairment. So we need to do everything we can to drive right. those numbers down. We will do so in a way with technology that is fair and works and does not okay. create false positives and addresses the kinds of questions that you're raising. Let me make a prediction here, is I, right before I yield back. Um, this won't be ready by 2026. Congress has asked the impossible. It's a wish, it's not a plan, and I think it's wrong to put you in a position to try and, and mandate this, and I yield back. The gentleman yields back. We'll now recognize Mr. Moulton for five minutes, Representative Moulton for five minutes. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, 
I was delighted to see that um, just last week, uh, the administration announced uh, $6 billion in funding for uh, high-speed rail, part of the federal state partnerships grants. We've also heard a lot about how some of these high-speed rail projects are over budget. Have you heard anything about, has anyone heard anything about California high-speed rail been being over budget, costing a lot of money? I think we hear about that all the time, all the time. What we never hear about is how much it costs to drive. What costs do we entail as a society when we only give people the option in most of the country of driving? Or frankly, for many people who might high, ride high, California high-speed rail someday, but currently have to take a car, what is that cost? Well, we commissioned the Harvard Kennedy School to look at this just for Massachusetts. The Just Do a Fair Cost Analysis. And their study showed that car ownership costs the state of Massachusetts $64 billion annually. Every single year, Massachusetts spends $64 billion to subsidize our car transportation system. That translates to $14,000 per household in Massachusetts, whether or not you own a car. All the non-car owners, the people who do take transit in the city, are paying $14,000 a year to subsidize everybody else who drives on our highways across the street, across the state. So my understanding is that we're finally going to start looking at this at a national level for the first time in a century. Section 11, 530 of the IIJ required the Federal Highway Administration to undertake and complete a cost allocation study. The first time that such a study has been done since, since well, I guess since the turn of the century. It's supposed to be completed within four years, which is a full year before Congress reauthorizes the service transportation programs. Mr. Bach, can you provide me with an update on the progress of the highway cost allocation study and what, if any, additional resources will be needed to ensure you complete the study in time? Uh, thank you, Representative Moulton, um, for, that in, uh, for that question. Um, we, um, I believe, are hiring contractors to assist uh, with delivering that uh, report uh, on, uh, on time, and I will follow up with your office with an exact date. Mr. Bott and Mr. Monhe, how is the FHWA thinking about the externalities of personal vehicles? that are placed on the general public. I mean, I don't think we think about the fact, for example, that a huge amount of our public safety budget, which again, we all support as taxpayers, goes to just emergency services on the highways. We wouldn't need nearly as many ambulances. We wouldn't need nearly as many state police cruisers if we didn't have so many people in cars and so many people, tens of thousands annually, getting in accidents and killing themselves. We don't ever think about those as costs to driving, but they are costs to driving. I, I think uh, the word you use, externalities, is the right one. You know, the, our highway system is the wonder of, of the world, is the envy of the world. My family's from Argentina, and what they wouldn't wish to have, what we have here in terms of what it does to our to productivity, to the ability to get our goods to market, but it has a cost, including uh, the, the crashes and the, and the deaths that you heard about, including the air quality, and the fact is that the, these, uh, these burdens are disproportionately impacting underserved communities. Uh, within my team, we're working on something called the transportation cost burden that includes exactly those issues. And so Mr. Monhe, the, the highway system was the envy of the world in the 1950s and 1960s, but all across the world, take Europe for example, the current focus is getting things off the highway. They don't want to be transporting goods by highway, they want to be on rail. Yes, sir. And they're I not building new for... highways, they're building high-speed rail systems that go three, four times as fast as highways. So why are we still so addicted to highways as the only option in America? And I, and I want to thank you for your support for rail, in particular for high-speed rail, uh, and we have in the bipartisan infrastructure law an enormous opportunity uh, to get our system up to snuff and to uh, be able to expand service. Uh, yes, but my uh, question is how are we thinking about modal transfer? Are we even having that discussion in our Department of Transportation? We are uh, asking all modal of our... Modal shift, I should say. We, we, we all, uh, you know, th these, these questions and, and moving moving goods into lower carbon uh, ways of getting around. Freight rail is a, is a wonderful example of that. Not just lower carbon, more efficient. Yes, sir, exactly, and safer. 
It doesn't sound like we're thinking about this at all. Oh, and we really are. We're, it's, we are. It's, it's baked into the, the benefit cost analysis that we do. It's, it's baked in, and we're, we're trying to get better information so that uh, state departments of transportation can propose better projects and be held accountable for them. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Great. Thank you. Next up, the uh, chair will recognize the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Burleson, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mrs. Hutchinson, uh, when I talked to truckers back home, they already feel that the federal government imposes strict regulations on them. This includes the hours of service regulations that limit how far they can drive. They are faced with long days that usually end with an hour searching for a parking spot, which is exhausting to them. And now you're telling them that they'll have to reach their destinations at a slower pace. With the hours of service regulation imposed or already imposed, is it smart to mandate the installation of trucks speed limiters when truckers are already heavily regulated. In their mind, when is enough enough? Many are afraid that if these mandates are implemented, then truckers will not only be subject to hours of service, but will be forced to get to their destination slower. And they feel like the need to make up... So here's my question. Many of these truckers may end up in a situation where they have to make up time, and, the, and because they they're have a speed limiter, the only place for them to make up time is probably in, or on you know, city streets, suburbs. Um, they'll have to make up time probably going through construction zones. Are you concerned about the, the motivation that you're creating to be able to, I think, reduce, reduce safety in some of these very important areas? Representative, thank you so much for this question. And I want to start by saying we share your commitment to drivers and certainly to their safety and the safety of everybody who travels. Um, in our prioritization of safety and on drivers, we, I personally have spent a lot of time traveling around and talking with drivers themselves. I was just in Missouri at OIDA sitting around the table hearing about their concerns firsthand. Uh, and I understand that sometimes drivers, they do feel uh, squeezed and uh, we're doing everything we can through bipartisan infrastructure, infrastructure law resources to study the compensation structure, structure, detention time. But I understand, Representative, that you are asking specifically about speed limiters. And I'll say again that we are underway in a process of rulemaking. However, we have not yet issued any notice of proposed rulemaking. We've not yet set. Well, I would encourage you to not implement that rule. I think that it would be, you would have an outcry from, from that community. You know, with all these regulations, it seems like um, there's a lack of trust. I trust the truck drivers in my community, and I'm extremely thank thankful for them. I, they kept this country alive during COVID. And so, but it seems like the administration's policy is a lack of trust. So my question is, do you trust truck drivers to be safe on the road? Representative, drivers are really at the heart of what we do, and safety is our mission at FMCSA, and I've met so many uh, drivers with millions of miles of safe driving. I spoke with groups of drivers as they uh, were about to compete in the safety championship in Indianapolis, um, and I know that there are so many uh, drivers, with, safe drivers committed to safety. So in, in, in short, you, you believe, you trust them and their commitment to safety, then why I would just hypothetically ask, why, do, why would we need to implement another rule on them to, to take away some of those decisions? Um, Mrs. Carlson, before you joined NHTSA, you were a law professor at UCLA Law School where you focused on air pollution and climate change law policy. On the side, you also consulted for a law firm called Sheer Edling. Is Sheer Edling a for-profit law firm? Yes or no? Uh, to the best of my knowledge, yes. Okay. And in your work for Sheer Edling, this firm brought forward a wave of climate change cases against traditional energy companies, American energy companies, that everyone has to purchase from. If Sheer Edling's lawsuits are successful, will it get an enormous contingency fee? I have no idea what their compensation structure is. Will you get a contingency fee? No. Okay. At UCLA, 
You also directed the Environmental Law Institute, which houses the Environmental Law Clinic. And students in that clinic were provided legal assistance. They provided it to Sheer Edling, the for-profit law firm that you also helped out. In fact, you bragged about this, that the clinic was working with these lawsuits to a major UCLA donor. So my question is, um, did your environmental law client, Sheer Edling, were they not able to pay for these legal expenses themselves? That, that you had to use UCLA students to help them? Uh, I did not direct the environmental law clinic at UCLA. And uh, as part of this, the uh, nomination process, I was extensively vetted and complied with all ethics rules and uh, have no further comment about it. Thank you. Well, I think the American consumer for energy is going to suffer. Thank you. Um, next, the chair recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. Saunier. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank all the witnesses for being here and um, the opportunity, but also the, the size and scope of what you have to do. Just the size of this investment, and you include the $380 billion in the Inflation Reduction Act on the infrastructure and energy transition, is unbelievably historic and complicated. Um, and then technology, as uh, I love UCLA, even though my district is next door to the mothership of the University of California and have many um, employees at Berkeley there. So, Ms. Carlson, I wanted to talk to you about technology, autonomous vehicles, and how we get this right. Uh, and of course, we've had some very well-publicized problems in San Francisco, just the west of my district, about AVs. So it's really important. In California, when I was in the legislature and I was chair of the Committee of Jurisdiction, uh, we had a lot of pressure from the tech companies in the Bay Area to push AVs. I, I brought Peter DeFazio that when he was chair of this committee, and we were in an AV going across the Bay Bridge, and he had a phone call. And, Somebody in Oregon, he said, I'm with Mark in San Francisco. I've seen the future. And we hung up. I said, Peter, we're stuck in traffic. Um, so all of this investment and your role to make sure they're safe, I have a facility that Secretary Buttigieg has come to, a uh, Gomentum station that does on an old military base. So talk to me a little bit about how you can coordinate for local governments like San Francisco, like the state of California, as a former member of the California Transportation Commission to provide best practices with research facilities like the three UC systems uh, research facilities so that we get this right. In California, we didn't allow AVs on the streets. Um, one of the operators, a famous one in the East Bay, Tesla decided to take it to another state. Within a few months, there were fatalities because they weren't ready for it. So talk to me about how we can get this technology right, not wait too long, but make sure the public is, is safe. So thank you. I share your concerns to both prioritize safety, but also to allow for innovation, because we want technology that saves lives. 42,000 people dying a year on our roads is not acceptable. Um, I should say I started my career in the California legislature, so go way back. Um, so do I, <laughs> but probably longer than you. <laughs> um, so uh, NHTSA does a number of things to try to coordinate with local governments and with states, and also to really work on these dual goals, always, of course, prioritizing safety. And so we work, uh, we're in constant communication with the California DMV, with the PUC. Um, as I'm sure you know, uh, automated vehicles can be on the road if they are FMVSS certified, if the local or state jurisdiction allows them to, be so, to do so. However, we issued a, a standing general order in 2021 that requires automated vehicles to report every single crash in which they are engaged, and that's how we learn about the kinds of crashes that have been the focus of so much attention recently. And we then investigate those crashes that warrant further investigation. We've recalled more than one automated vehicle when we found problems. We also, to the degree we can, subject to confidential business information, share that information with our state and local partners and try to be as absolutely transparent as possible. We're also interested in setting up a demonstration program that would really try to marry safety with allowing for a limited deployment of some automated vehicles that might need exemptions from our federal motor vehicle safety standards. The idea here is to get NHTSA involved as, you know, you can think about it as a cop on the beat, really making certain that companies have 
safety cultures in place, that they've built redundancies into their systems. One of the things you worry about is something fails, you want something to back it up in the event that it fails. Um, and to really, again, promote transparency and to promote information sharing with state and local governments. Well, we really need to get this right. Given your background in California, San Francisco clearly felt like they wanted to be the home of this uh, and they had to rescind it and the police department was very critical of it. Uh, Mr. Mung or Secretary Mungi, the your position is really important. Trying to get, I'm proud of the fact that my bill, Clean Quarter Acts, that allowed for the infrastructure went into the larger bill. Getting this right with the marketplace, the Japanese work much closer in my history than we do with the manufacturers. What are you doing to work with the manufacturers of vehicles, making sure the infrastructure comes together in a smart and efficient way? And to support uh, automated vehicles, sir? No, this is for everything. Oh, uh, we have a deep partnership uh, across industry, um, uh, including uh, in the construction uh, realms uh, for road builders with OEMs as they try to build out their supply chains. Uh, it is a critical piece of our success, and every single one of us here has deep relationships on these enormous industries. Thank you. I'll follow up with you. I yield back. Great. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Utah, Mr. Owens, for five minutes. Thank you. Thank you so much for this important hearing today. Uh, my question today is uh, start with Ms. Ms. Fernandez um, and the Federal uh, Transit Administration. In my district, uh, the Utah's Transit Authority Reconnect Program provides real-time responsive solutions to give stranded uh, passengers a way to get home. This forward-looking program links passengers with, with ride share or taxi companies to complete their journey when unplanned service disruptions occur. Unfortunately, the ReConnect program is not presently eligible for the FTA's taxi cab exception rule, which exempts controlled substance and alcohol testing for contracted ride share companies when the passenger chooses to complete their transit. Because the ReConnect program proactively does this for them, the test requirement remains. So Mrs. Fernandez, uh, is the FDA working to update and streamline the taxi cab exemption rule that will help UTA innovation expansion to better serve the needs of their passengers? Uh, Mr. Owens, uh, thank you, Representative Owens. Thank you very much for that question, and uh, it's good to see you. Um, regarding the uh, request that uh, from the uh, Salt Lake City, uh, Utah Transit Authority, um, to re request requesting the exemption for the taxi cab. I would say that we at the Federal Transit Administration are following the law as it relates to drug and alcohol testing. And in order for the, the agency to provide tra taxi cab service, the agency directly cannot identify the operator um, the agency can provide vouchers, but they should not identify the operator. And that is one of the um, guidance that we provided to them when they inquired about um, this uh, first mile, last mile. First last, mass, last mile is very important. It's the way to connect to public transportation. Um, however, uh, the, the law has to be followed. And uh, in this instance, we have provided guidance to them. Uh, you know, when we're talking about something that's innovative, we're talking about not, not the law, but basically um, understanding that because of this opportunity to provide the service, they're taking on this opportunity to, to, um, uh, that the, the customer normally takes. Is there anything to be done to, to understand that there is a, a new way of trying to service customers and that they should not be held responsible to have testing done uh, just because they've they decided to, to take that over? Yeah. Uh the, it, in just um, to add to the response I provided, uh, Representative Owens, uh, we have been working very closely with the transit agencies uh, to identify opportunities for microtransit. We understand that first mile, last mile are, uh, is important. In this instance, uh, when this was uh, shared with us by the agency, we provided our guidance to the agency regarding how they could achieve that first mile, last mile without um, uh, going against can, what can the, I, can I, can I ask you the requirements quickly? of the law. Can, I, can you share with us what that was? Because they're, they're asking for an exemption that's already out there for other companies uh, that's providing a service because they're being innovative and thinking outside the box. I would think that you would work with them to provide an exemption that they would normally get if the customer was doing it by themselves. It's, it's just a matter of the customer is asking for the exemption or the company giving the same service guy is asking for the exemption. So 
Can't you work with them because this isn't an innovative way of providing a service? Uh, uh, Representative Owens, I will um, commit to uh, reaching out to your office as well as have our regional office connect uh, with the transit agency to have further discussions on this matter. Okay, um, Mr. Uh, uh, Moji, uh, can you provide, right now Utah is one of the fast growing states in the union since 2020. We're trying to, to absorb this growth by uh, infrastructure further south. Can you provide some insight on how the federal funds or transportation products will benefit both the urban, which is where we're trying to push infrastructure to, and the, uh, I'm sorry, the urban and the rural, the rural community is where we're trying to push the infrastructure to. Is there anything you can, can provide to help us understand how you might be yes, sir. So supporting um, us in that effort? Thank you. Salt Lake City has been a, a major uh, national leader in uh, driving a lot of the things that we've talked about. When it comes to rural, uh, uh, we have developed something uh, that was uh, codified in, in the law called the Routes Initiative, which focuses on helping rural communities uh, get, use, deploy the funding that's available to them. We've done over 200 debriefs with rural communities uh, to make sure that they, if they didn't get, our, our grants are very competitive, if they didn't get one, that they have a better shot next time. The very first uh, product that we put out uh, to support the EV uh, charging revolution is about, um, uh, was focused on rural deployment. So what do they need to do? How do they need to work with utilities, siting? Uh, and so uh, this is a major priority for us. Another example is the Chrissy program, which is a, a freight rail uh, program. Uh, a, a very large percentage of those dollars went to rural communities. Okay, thank, thank you, and I yield back. Thank you so much. The gentleman yields back. We will now go to Representative Garamendi for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, are you tired yet? Thank you so very much for being here. Uh, you have uh, under taken extraordinary responsibilities. Uh, the uh, legislation that has passed this House, it's been less than a year and a half, almost just short of two years now that you've had uh, the responsibility of carrying it out. And my assessment is you've done a very, very fine job. A lot of new legislation, new programs, new requirements, uh, new rules, uh, procedures, uh, and it's gone well. Uh, in my district, thank you. Uh, big projects, high-speed rail, a lot of money, major effort in California to develop high-speed rail system. I've personally been at that since 1988. Learned patience here. But you're, uh, you've come forward, and I thank you for providing that uh, extraordinary amount of money. That'll move that system along, and eventually it will get built. <clears throat> a lot of little things along the way. Ms. Fernandez, thank you. I appreciate the work you've uh, provided uh, in my district for uh, electrification. Not easy. There was no electrification program two years ago, but there is now. And my district's benefiting from it, and I expect my colleagues here um, have also done so. Highways, a pile of money has been put out there. A lot of it going through the states. Uh, a lot of the delays, if there are in fact delays, are result of the state trying to uh, figure out how to handle just an extraordinary amount of new money. Projects that were not on the books or were put off the books because they didn't have the money, they now have it. Because this because the Biden administration, together with the Democrats in the House and the Senate, put forward the largest infrastructure program ever in this nation. And all of us, Democrat and Republicans, are benefiting from it. More importantly, so are our citizens. I thank you for the work you're doing. Not easy. You've done well with it. Of course, there are going to be problems. I've got a slew of questions. My staff said, ask them this, ask them that. I think I just want to thank you. And yes, I'll submit the questions to you. Overarching on my mind for many, many years now has been rebuilding the American industrial system. And built into the legislation is by America requirements all the way through. And I know that all of you in your work are faced with conflicting um, ideas, conflicting plans. Well, we can't go all 100% by America because, because. 
But however, the law is clear, and that is we are intent upon building an industrial policy for the United States. And each of you, whether it's transit, highways, or the overarching responsibility of the, of the uh, secretary, you have an opportunity to carry out the goal of the legislation, which is to buy America. There is a problem, however, and that's the 1983 blanket waiver of the Buy America provisions. I urge you to terminate that provision. 1983 waived almost all of the Buy America requirements and it is in conflict with the new law and regulations that you put forward. You've been wrestling with it. I frankly don't understand what the wrestling match is about. Terminate it. Kill it, get rid of it, and then we can get on with the overarching Buy America requirements that we uh, now have in place. I'll go on and on, but the reality is each of you and the men and women that work with you are implementing successfully, not as fast as any one of us might want because we want to take it back to our district and say, even though I didn't vote for the bill, I'm going to take credit for it. Shall I say that again to my Republican colleagues? But the reality is you're doing a good job, and I thank you for that. With that, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. We will now recognize Representative Mann for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all for being here today. I represent the big first district of Kansas. As the geographic center of the United States, Kansas offers an excellent transportation advantages for several industries. In order to maintain these advantages, it's imperative that our state's infrastructure is up to date and safe for multimodal uses, and they have an adequately, adequately staffed workforce. Congress implemented several initiatives to increase industry workforces. However, there have been concerns about how some programs have been implemented. Um, question for you, Ms. Hutchison. Um, as you know, Congress mandated that the DOT create a pilot program through IIJA to train individuals between the ages of 18 and 20 to be professional truck drivers. These three-year pilot has 3,000 apprentice slots available at any one time, and it's critical to help the next generation of drivers get the necessary training to begin satisfying and productive careers in trucking. DOT has been slow to implement SDAP, and participation numbers are so far extremely concerning. Can you tell us what steps um, you're taking to build out this pilot program, increase participation, and prevent the pilot program from failing? Representative Mann, thank you for the question about the Safe Driver Apprenticeship Program. We are working hard to build out this program. You know, the purpose is really to determine whether younger drivers can operate as safe as or more safely even than the general commercial motor vehicle operator population, and that's through apprenticeship and training. Uh, we are continuing to engage with stakeholders to increase participation in the program. We're using multiple channels, and we're really stepping it up, including social media, paid media, outreach specifically to vocational high schools. We're sending direct mail, um, and we have numerous events planned for this coming quarter and starting in January. The, the, you said you've engaged stakeholders. Um, as you're doing that, any indication on why participation rates are so low and anything of note that stakeholders are telling your department? Thank you for the question, Mr. Mann. Very often we're finding that stakeholders never knew about it. Uh, and that means we need to increase our reach and really use the resources granted to us by Congress to ensure that stakeholders know of this opportunity. So then what specific changes are, are you making moving forward to address that concerns and the other concerns that have caused the low stakeholder involvement? Uh, Representative, we need to get the word out and we need to do it quickly. Starting in January, we are really stepping it up. Uh, when we receive questions about the requirements, we work quickly to answer them on a one-on-one -on -one basis and help to step anyone who's interested in the program, step them through the process. Yeah, you know, as we all know, the, the truck driver shortage is a huge issue. And in my view, you know, allowing folks to become truck drivers at the age of 18, you know, right after high school, before they do something else in, in the hopes they might come back to the industry is really important. So you're, this program, this pilot program, I, I think there's a lot at stake and potentially if done well, 
and well received could start to move the needle for this huge shortage that impacts Kansas ag producers, our industrial companies, um, folks all over the country. So appreciate um, th those questions. We'd love to continue to work with your office to make sure the program's successful. Um, thank you for being here, and with that, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. We will now recognize Representative Van Orden for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman John Duarte from the great state of California. Um, Mr. Monhe, I'm gonna pick up where my colleague from Minnesota left off and also where I left off talking to your boss a little bit ago. Do you understand that cobalt is a critical mineral that is used in electric vehicle batteries? Yes, sir. Do you understand that 4.3% of these batteries are comprised of cobalt? That sounds right, sir. Do you understand that 70% of the world's cobalt is mined in the Democratic Republic of Congo? Yes, sir. Do you understand that 15 to 30% of the mines in the Democratic Republic of Congo are called artesian mines? Yes, sir. Do you understand that these artesian mines have thousands of children working in the condition of essentially slavery, mining cobalt in the Democratic Republic of Congo? Yes, sir. You do, okay. Does the Biden administration still insist on having 50% of all of the vehicles manufactured in the United States by 2030 be electric? Sir, uh, Congress sent a very clear signal in the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law and the Inflation Reduction Act that we needed to move much more of this uh, materials uh, onshoring, nearshoring. Uh, the bill includes $7 billion uh, for EV. I'm going to interrupt you because that's not the question I asked you. I asked you a very specific question. Does the Biden administration still want 50% of the vehicles produced in the United States of America to be EVs by 2030, yes or no? Yes. Okay. What year is it now, sir? 2023, sir. Okay, almost 2024. So that gives us, what, six years to meet this goal? That's All right. right. We're giving approximately 75, up to $7,500 per electric vehicle, correct? Tax credits and all that stuff? That's correct. And, and it is now income-based with the IIJA. That's right. There's an income okay. limit. So de facto, this is not a political statement. The United States government is subsidizing child slavery in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Because I don't care what you say, then we've got to get this back on shore and whatnot. That's not the case today. As we speak, there are children in the Democratic Republic of Congo mining cobalt with their hands so that the Biden administration can meet this unrealistic goal of 2030. That is a fact. That is a fact, sir. So do you think it is a moral imperative that the United States government try to prevent child slavery? Yes, sir. Even at the expense of your artificially created 2030 goal to have 50% of all the vehicles produced in the United States of America be electric vehicles? Sir, every extractive, every mining industry uh, has a spotty record. Whoa, whoa, when no, stop. When it and comes to no, 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 no. rights no, violations, no. including oil and gas industry, sir. Okay, Nigeria, you listen to me, mister. Myanmar. We are talking Africa. about child slavery, sir. I have three kids. Uh, and guess what? I, I, I'm having my 11th people, people, grandchild. People, so would you want Africa your three children same, mining same cobalt same in the Democratic their, Republic of Congo so that you and your boss and the Biden administration can have 50% of the electric vehicles produced in the United States by 2030 be electric vehicles or not. Which this is question? not a political thing, sir. You guys are subsidizing child slavery. Do you understand that? That is not a Democrat issue. It's not a Republican issue, an independent issue. That is a human rights issue. We, we the United States government, the executive branch of the United States government, de facto, right now, as we speak, are subsidizing child slavery. And I will have absolutely no part of that and no one with a conscience should. I yield back.
The gentleman yields back. We will now recognize Representative Van Drew for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, before I ask the questions I had prepared to ask, I just had some thoughts on uh, my colleague, uh, the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Moulton, when he spoke of um, mass transportation. And I, I, if I understood him correctly, how we spend too much money on roads, uh, streets, highways. Uh, people in America, in the United States of America, do like to have their independence. They like to have their autonomy. They like to have their freedom. And part of that is being able to go where we want to go, when we want to go, individually, um, with our families, without the interference of government. Now, I believe in mass transportation. I think almost all of us do think it has a role. I support it, and I support rail very strongly. But there is no question that the investment that we make in roads, streets, and highways is very, very important. Um, we need good roads. We need good highways. We need to have safe and good streets. Um, and to suggest that Europe does it differently doesn't mean anything to me. I don't know when we started in the United States of America to worry more about what other foreign countries do than what we do. We're the leader. I believe we're the best nation on the face of the earth in every way. And this is one of those ways. I think we can all remember when we were young folks and we got our license to drive and what a big deal it was, that independence. It's the American way. And I just wanted to make that comment. No, we're not Europe. No, we're not other countries. No, we're not a globalist country. Um, we are American exceptionalists. You know, early this year, the federal government Carrier Safety Administration proposed a federal speed limit on heavy trucks. The federal speed limit would restrict trucks over 26,000 pounds to whatever the speed the federal government decides. The same federal government that very often, in many ways, no reflection on any of you, but cannot get out of its own way. It would be enforced. It would be enforced by digital devices attached to trucks. Talk about Big Brother. I'm here to say that this policy, in my opinion, is arbitrary. It is dangerous. It is overreaching. The proposed federal truck speed limit takes an arbitrary, one-size-fits-all reality on highway driving. Truckers need a range of speeds in order to safely drive on the highway. I wish all those folks who made these regulations actually drove a truck. It might be good for them. And there were over 100,000 comments on this issue that were submitted to the draft rule. These drivers give many examples of situations in which they need to accelerate for safety, whether it's merging into highway speed traffic, building momentum to go up a hill, or simply keeping up with the flow of traffic. It is a hard and difficult job, and they do it well. Your policy would take those options away from them. We're tired of this. We're tired of big government. You know, one gentleman, his comment was, not mine, his, quote, this is a stupid idea, end quote. The policy is overreach. We're tired of overreach. It's a classic example of government coming to save us, you know, against our, for, for ourselves. There's lots of independent truckers, and they would be harmed by this policy. So I have a question for you. Have you estimated how many employee drivers would be impacted by your proposal and how it would affect their earnings? I have three additional questions, but I'm going to submit them for the record because I'd like a thorough answer. Uh, Administrator Hutchinson, could you comment on this issue? And could you comment how it's going to affect individual drivers to have a digital device on their truck? Nobody's asked for this. This is another creation of big government, in my opinion. Please we'll go forward. Representative, thank you for raising this issue and the opportunity to respond. Um, I'll clarify, You're, you are correct. We received many, many comments. Over 14,000 comments were submitted for the record uh, when we issued an advanced notice of proposed rulemaking. We haven't yet issued a notice of proposed rulemaking. When we do so, it will include much of the analysis that you and your colleagues have been asking for here 
when that is publicly viewable, I'd be happy to share it with your audience. I would appreciate that, and I sure hope that you do not rule for this because it is a bad idea. It's bad for truckers. It's bad for the supply chain. It is bad for the United States of America. Mr. Chairman, I have two additional questions I would ask that I would want to submit them for the record to be put into the record, and I yield back. Without objection on your request, the gentleman yields back, and we now recognize Representative Collins for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to direct my questions to uh, you, Administrator Hutchison and, and Ms. Carlson, if you don't mind. Um, I want to talk about the uh, joint notice of proposal for the AEBs, the Automatic Emergency Braking System. I, I'm sorry I've been running around here like crazy. I don't know if you've addressed that yet this morning, have you? Uh, only a little bit. So only, only a little only bit. Only a little bit. We welcome your questions. You, well, do you have an update on when this rule may be finalized? It, this is for the light vehicle? The, or autom the automatic emergency braking system. So we have two proposals right now. We have a light duty rule. That no, this is for the heavy duty. For the heavy duty. Uh, the light duty comes after the heavy duty. Okay. We are um, we're working to finalize the rule uh, in spring of 2024. In the spring of when? 2024. Okay. I can't hear a lot. I don't know if you y'all's mics are far away or what. Um, okay, so shout. we just we just completed the comment period, right? So I guess my question is kind of like Mr. Massey, and I'd love for both of you to have to answer this. Do you think since after the finalization of the rules, and then you have a, a period after that, do you really think that the safety standards are gonna be there to meet the technological requirements? to make this system effective. So um, if you don't mind, Administrator Hutchison, happy to yield to you in a moment, but um, I do want to say that we take the comments very, very seriously. That is the purpose of the comments is to inform us. I mean, I guess it's just a simple okay. question. Do you think the technology is going to be there? So, so our, our best sense is that with appropriate lead time, which is something that we consider in finalizing the rule, that the technology will save hundreds of lives and prevent thousands of injuries. I guess I'm kind of like Mr. Massey. I just don't think hope is a very good business plan. Um, this is based on a very extensive analysis. We include this in a regulatory impact analysis. I'd like that to I'd be happy to share with you. Ms. Ms. Hutchison, if you don't mind, um, do, you, do you think that you are trying to just meet a congressional deadline? I mean, in, in, and I, and I ask that just at the expense of, of um, satisfying the requirements and, and, you know, and, and, and not making sure that the net technology is there. Uh, Representative, I, I really appreciate your questions and um, you know, appreciate the firsthand knowledge you have in the trucking industry. I know you're a second or third generation uh, family operator. Uh, so they're very pointed questions at us. Um, Automatic emergency braking, as you note, is congressionally mandated. The vehicle technology itself is analyzed by our colleagues at NHTSA. So do you have any, do you have any examples of where y'all have been addressing the false uh, activations? Have, have y'all got any examples of consulting with truck drivers? Uh, representative, um, I'm going to divide my comments from the rulemaking to preserve the fidelity of the rulemaking progress and just say that I have ridden along with many truck drivers uh, and talked about this very issue on automatic. You're vehicle. talking to a trucker. Uh, uh, I'm in the trucking business. As yes. a matter of fact, I, I probably own about 80 trucks with the collision avoidance of device is what we call it on the front of them. And I will tell you, they are not bulletproof. They're nowhere near it. And, and I don't, are you aware of what happens when this device goes off at 50, 60 miles an hour? Yes, you're not wearing, it, you're not wearing a seatbelt. It'll put you to the, to the windshield almost. And it's, it's not there. The technology is not there. And I don't understand why the, the federal agencies, the FMCSA or NH, either one of you, push programs. I'm much like Mr. Massey. We, we're put, listen, we all want to be safe. That's why I tried them. But they don't work perfectly yet, and they're very expensive. As a matter of fact, you, you, can't, you can't disable them, so you can't get parts for them right now. So you know what you do? You wind up parking the vehicle. So the, the, you're, you're pushing standards that the technology is not available. And, and I really want 
you to understand that. I'm not trying to be ugly or anything. I'm just telling you from someone in the industry, that's my outlook on it. Now, the other thing I want to tell you, and, 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 and I want to follow up with Mr. Van Drew and what Mr. Burleson said about speed limiters. We have speed limiters out there now. They're called speed limit signs. They're enforced by law enforcement. Ma'am, you have CSA. Do you know what CSA is, the CSA scores? Yes, sir, I do. We get them monthly. They show us when our drivers get tickets for speeding. Do you know who also looks at that? Our insurance companies. The, the free marketplace works. And when, when a truck driver is not insurable due to speeding, then he's let go or she's let go. So we don't need the federal government enforcing something like this on, on truckers. And the other thing I, I just want to finish up with is this. The AAA has come out with time and time again reports that say over 75% of accidents out there when a, when a heavy truck and a car is involved, it's the car's fault. It's not even the truck's fault. But yet you're wanting to punish the heavy Class 8 trucks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sorry I went over and I yield back. Gentleman yields back. The chair will recognize himself, Congressman Duarte, for five minutes. Well, thank you all for being here. Um, I represent the Central Valley District, California 13, from Modesto down to Fresno, home of the California High Speed Rail Project, or at least great portions of it. And um, this is a boondoggle. This is a boondoggle that will cost carbon and billions of dollars never pay for itself in fares. It will never pay, offset itself in carbon emissions. It's made of concrete. These are elevated platforms in the air. There might be some great high-speed rail around the world. There might be some great high-speed rail projects that, that you folks fund in California or Florida uh, and other places around the nation. I just want to testify to you today, this is not one of them. This is a hoax. As we drive in our congested freeways in the Central Valley on Highway 99 and Highway 5, potholes, traffic, jammed up, we literally see elevated platforms high above us, high above us, disconnected from other elevated platforms that are the high-speed rail projects. This thing is tanking, and we just had $3.1 billion come, I think, from you, Mr. Manye. Why are you doing this? Let me just ask you, why are you continuing to fund the high-speed rail project in California versus freeways, versus intersections, versus other traffic needs? And I'll just remind you before you answer, your agency's mission is to, quote, deliver the world's leading transportation system, serving the American people and economy through safe, efficient, sustainable, and equitable movements of people and goods. This is one of the lowest income districts in the country. We have the 18th highest poverty level in the country. Um, you're not meeting our transportation needs. You may be meeting some vanity needs in the Bay Area or LA, but you're not meeting our needs. Our needs are for freeways and conventional transportation. What motivates you to continue funding the high-speed rail at the exclusion of the transportation infrastructure we actually need? Um, thank you, sir. Um, we. Uh, we have been building uh, a lot of roads, uh, 175,000 miles of roads, uh, thanks to bipartisan infrastructure law. But uh, I've been stuck in that. Not in my district. Thank you, but not in my district. My district, when it sees Transportation Infrastructure Jobs Act money, it sees elevated, isolated platforms up in the sky of a senseless investment that'll be a senseless investment 10 and 20 years from now. Uh, that's not, uh, I'm sure the data does not uh, bear that out. but. Um, you know, the project that you're talking about is one that we are watching carefully. It is going to be the key to future mobility. They've been, I've been stuck in that traffic for a long, for, uh, for a long time myself. Uh, any transportation uh, secretary across this country can tell you, you can't build enough freeways to get out of the problem. You've got to get people out of cars, and that's part of what the, the high-speed rail system is about. Uh, that project right now has 12,000 good jobs on the ground in California. So would dams, so would freeways, so would roadways, so would intersections, so would the infrastructure assets that we actually need. We are gonna oversee that project very carefully. Uh, as you said, we, we did give a, a, a grant to the, to the project. It is part of the future of the transportation net, uh, system that's gonna- that's There, gonna, there is uh, no history of effective oversight of this project so far. 
There is none. It, it is widely known as one of the largest boondoggles in infrastructure history, and you're continuing to fund it. Now, exactly how are you gonna oversee it going forward in a way that hasn't been, it hasn't been overseen in the past? We, uh, we absolutely have learned uh, from the history of, of managing projects like this. Uh, it's not a myth. It's not, I mean, high-speed rail exists across the country, and President Biden believes that America deserves a world-class rail. Th this project, elevated over freeways, elevated over river canyons, elevated over cities, a high-speed rail engineered to s soar over the top of all other infrastructure in cities through a, a very low population density area to connect two very remote areas that you have no engineering to get the last mile on. You don't know how you're gonna get through to Hatchapies. You don't know how you're gonna get through the Bay Area. This is simply moving people from Merced to Bakersfield on elevated platforms that are going to cost probably over $100 billion by the time you're done connecting two fairly mid-sized communities in rural areas. Then you can figure out how to get over the mountains. Please, I mean, this, this is ridiculous. Why are you not building water infrastructure? I realize that's not in the Department of Transportation, but why are you not building freeways? I drive from Modesto to San Francisco to get to the airport to come here to do this. And I can tell you, I'm glad it's only one day a week that I have to go through the morning traffic because my constituents can't get to the best job market in the world because the infrastructure dollars are going towards a bullet train down in the middle of the valley instead of connecting them to the places they actually want to go. Please quit funding this boondoggle. Yes, sir. Uh, you know, the California High Speed Rail Authority, uh, they're through 98% of the right of way. They're making good progress. Uh, we support this project. Let them pay for it themselves. Yes, sir. Thank you. I'll yield back to myself, I guess. Um, what am I doing here? Let's see. Are there any further questions from members of the committee who have not been recognized? Seeing none, that concludes our hearing for today. I would like to thank each of the witnesses for your testimony. The committee stands adjourned.